Okay, let's get started. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sumi Terry. I'm the director of the Asia program and director of the Hyundai Motor Korea Foundation Center for Korean History and Public Policy here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'll talk, try to talk slower because I hear that as a translation. Um, for those of you who may not know, Woodrow, the Woodrow Wilson Center was established by the Act of Congress in 1968 as a nonpartisan living monument to our 28th president to serve as a bridge between scholarship and policymakers. Our purpose, uh, in the words of Congressional Charter, is to strengthen the fruitful relations between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. Our currency is knowledge, and our focus is independent analysis. We place value on history and regional context and really fold them into our products. So it is a pleasure uh, for the Woodrow Wilson Center to host this special conference on the Jeju April 3rd incident in the broader context of human rights, history, and the us Rock Alliance. Next year marks the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Armistice of the Korean War, the us Rock Alliance, uh, a special alliance that is forged in blood that has withstood the test of time. The past seven decades has seen a period of immense growth for South Korea, both in political and economic development, and a period of long peace in the peninsula. Imperfect and shaky at times, but no war has broken out, right? We don't have a war that has broken out in the region for the past decades, uh, much, as I would say, thanks to our ironclad alliance. Today, South Korea, uh, with the world's sixth largest military and 10th largest economy, has become an increasingly important partner for the United States and an increasingly important player on the global stage. And together, the United States and South Korea really have a historic opportunity to create a closer alliance for the 21st century. So in this context today, we are here to examine the Jeju April 3rd incident and other human rights issues with a view toward further strengthening our alliance and solidarity between the governments and peoples of our two great nations. Um, by joining, jointly examining the past and drawing lessons from history, I'm confident that we can build a brighter future together. Um, so with that, before we begin our conference, I'd like to first express a special welcome uh, to our delegation from South Korea, led by uh, Mr. Ko Hee Bum, chairman of the Jeju April 3rd Peace Foundation, former mayor of Jeju City, and co-founder of the Hungary, a major newspaper in South Korea. Uh, Mr. Oh Im Jung, Chairman of the Association for the Jeju April 3rd Bereaved Families, and Mr. Yang Jo Hoon, Member of the National Committee for Investigation of the Truth on the Jeju April 3rd Incident, and former Chairman of the Jeju Peace Foundation. And of course, special thanks to Ms. Suyeon Yang, who is sitting here in the panel, Chairwoman of Warden Korea, for her support in making this conference possible. And of course, a warm welcome to Professor Moon Jung-in, who is sitting right there, um, and Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, and Professor Song Yu Lee from Fletcher School are my dear colleagues and friends. So without further ado, I would like to now invite Mr. Ko Hee Bum, Chairman of the Jeju April 3rd Peace Foundation, to give his welcoming remarks. Mr. Ko, the podium is yours. There's a name tent there that's hardly maybe Mr. Cole's name tent. Thank you for noticing that. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are very pleased to hold a symposium with Withrow Wilson Center to explore the truth of Jeju April 3 and its challenges. I would like to thank Mark Green, CEO of Woodrow Wilson Center and CEO of uh, World in Korea, Yang Suyun, and my deepest 
gratitude should go to Dr. Sumiteri, who worked hard to make this event possible, and our presenters and other participants for coming here to remember Jeju April 3. Uh, now I'll speak in Korean. Uh, maybe you need earphone. Uh, 제주 사삼은 74년 전 당시 미 군장의 관할 하에서 그리고 대한민국 정부 수립 이후에는 미 군사 공군단의 통제 아래에서 발생했습니다. 약 7년간 지속됐던 참상 속에서 3만여 명의 민간인이 목숨을 잃고 14만 유족들의 가슴에 오늘날까지도 지워지지 않는 커다란 상처를 남겼습니다. 그러나 제주 4.3은 어두웠던 과거를 기억하고 연대하며 싸워온 제주도민들의 오랜 여정으로 한 발자국씩 전진할 수 있었습니다. 지난 2000년 4.3 특별법이 제정되고 그에 따라서 정부의 공식 진상조사 보고서가 나왔고 그래서 대통령의 공식 사과가 있었습니다. 작년에는 특별법이 전면 개정되면서 희생자들에 대한 보상금이 지급되고 있고 당시 불법적인 재판으로 억울하게 옥살이를 한 희생자들이 재심을 통해서 법원으로부터 무죄 판결을 받고 있습니다. 이제 사삼은 새로운 전기를 맞고 있습니다. 국내에서 과거사 해결을 위한 다양한 조치들이 구체적이고 명백하게 진행되면서 제주도민과 유족들은 묻고 있습니다. 그렇다면 제주 사삼에 직접적인 관계가 있는 미국은 이 문제에 대해서 어떤 의견을 갖고 있는지를 진정한 화해와 건전한 미래로 나아가기 위해서 우리에게 필요한 것은 진실과 정의 그리고 책임일 것입니다. 생명과 자유와 행복을 가장 소중한 가치로 간직하고 있는 미국은 이제 제주인들이 전 천부의 권리를 빼앗겼던 제주 사삼의 진실과 마주할 때입니다. 그 진실에 기초한 정의로운 해결의 도정에 여러분들을 초대합니다. 이것이 한국과 미국의 관계도 건전하고 굳건하게 만들 것입니다. 오늘 심포지움의 주제인 제주 4.3의 인권 그리고 동맹은 이러한 의미를 담고 있습니다. Every step of progress in this country, every expansion of freedom, every expression of our deepest ideals have been won through efforts that made the status quo uncomfortable. 오바마 대통령은 조지 플로이드 사망에 대한 시위를 지지하면서 이렇게 말했습니다. 우리도 오늘 다소 불편할 수도 있는 논의를 통해서 진보와 자유 그리고 이상을 향한 첫 발자국을 내딛게 되기를 바랍니다. 감사합니다. Thank you. So we we'll get started with our first panel. I'm just going to quickly introduce our panelists. All of you should have this bio packet. So instead of reading them, I will just quickly introduce our panelists. Um, and they will in make initial comments. And then we'll open the floor up for the questions. So for our first panel, we have on my left, Professor Song Yun Lee of the Fletcher School at Tufts University, Ms. Soon Yang, um, Chairwoman of Warden Korea and Chairwoman of the Jeju <coughs> April 3rd Memorial and Families Association of the United States, Mr. Jo Hoon Young, member of the National Committee for Investigation of the Truth about the Jeju April 3rd incident. And last but not least, we have Ambassador Kathy Stevens, President and CEO of the Korea Economic Institute of America and formerly very popular US Ambassador to South Korea. Again, please refer to the bio packets um, for, for details. So I would like to begin, uh, starting with my left here, with Professor Lee, if that's okay with you, then followed by Ms. Yang, Mr. Yang, and Ambassador Stevens. Professor Lee, so perhaps you could start uh, by placing this issue in the U.S. Rock and uh, this U.S. Rock Alliance in, in historical context. Would you start? I could try. I'll <laughs> do my best. 
Well, thank you everyone for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be here with us. And thank you, Dr. Terry and the Wilson Center for this opportunity to share with you some of my views on this very dark chapter in Korean history. The overwhelming role of the United States in determining, shaping <coughs> the future of South Korea presents some big questions from liberating Korea from 35 years of Japanese colonial rule by vanquishing Imperial Japan in 1945 and immediately thereafter with the Soviet Union partitioning the Korean Peninsula into two halves to abandoning South Korea in 1949 despite having governed South Korea for three years to the very next year returning to South Korea to defend it against the North Korean invading forces, the U.S. has played enormous roles, first as liberator, perhaps even as the midwife in facilitating the separate and controversial elections in South Korea only under the auspices of the United Nations on May 10th, 1948, and thereby playing a major role in the birth of the Republic of Korea, to really saving South Korea from state collapse in 1950, and thereafter the often touted ironclad alliance between South Korea and the United States, which has grown tremendously over the last seven decades into not an ordinary alliance, but a truly special alliance based on the share values and beliefs and systems of democracy, peace, freedom, and justice. It is something to behold, the special bilateral relationship between the U.S. and South Korea. Yet, 75 years ago, the United States oversaw events that perhaps I would deem paint as the antithesis, the opposite of democracy, human rights, peace, and justice. And I refer to you, ladies and gentlemen, as you might surmise, to the prolonged mass killings and torture of civilians, including women, over 3,000 women killed, including children, over 800 children under the age of 10 also killed. An extreme human rights violation like this can never be swept under the rug, but successive South Korean regimes did their best to do just that. Censorship during the Syngman Rhee years from 1948 to 1960, and also during the Park jong Yi years from 1961 to 1979, meant that South Koreans were not entirely free to raise questions inconvenient and uncomfortable questions about the Jeju massacre. It also meant that the United States saw no compelling need to study, to remember, and to raise issues about the U.S. role as these mass atrocities were committed by South Korean instruments of power, the constabulary, the police force, and so on. What makes this issue particularly difficult to remember, to face frankly, and to honor the victims is that during the most intense period of the brutal crackdown and the mass killings, the South Korean instruments of force still lay under the operational control of the United States military government. And I refer to the period following the formal establishment of the Republic of Korea on August 15, 1948. The next month, in September 1948, South Korean troops killed, confirmed number, 153. These numbers are all very conservative, but these are confirmed cases. In October 1948, South Korean troops killed over 800 folks. In November, 2,205. In December, almost 3,000 people, 2,974. January, over 2,000. 
and so on, until the US military withdrew at the end of June 1949. Again, during this period, the United States military held sway, held operational command and control over the deployment of South Korean forces. So rather than try to forget the past, rather than hide behind the wall of denialism, in my humble opinion, I think this is an issue that should be taught, remembered, visited frequently, and the victims honored. It's an issue that must be remembered in perpetuity. And what is the best way to remember it? Well, to discuss what happened, to explore jointly ways to commemorate and honor the victims, and also to seek healing and reconciliation. <clears throat> and as many of you know, for the first time ever in South Korean history, the top leader of a conservative party, President-elect Yoon suk yeol in April became the first top leader of the conservative party to pay his respects by visiting the Jeju Peace Park. I think that's a meaningful symbolic act toward healing and mitigating the deep ideological divide within South Korean society. And when I observed this welcome development in early April, I thereafter wrote a humble op-ed calling for one day President Biden to visit, perhaps together with President Yoon, the Jeju Peace Park, thus showing that the United States is not only a just nation, but cares for human rights of its allies, that the United States cares about the past, that the United States is not afraid to face the ghosts of the past. President Obama, as president, in May 2016, together with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, visited the Hiroshima Peace Park. It was somewhat controversial, perhaps understandably, some families of US veterans in the Second World War were not thrilled. But President Obama at the park said the following, memories must never fade. Memory allows us to fight complacency. It fuels our moral imagination. It allows us to change. And although it's been only six years or so, six and a half years since this event, I think history will judge that visit by President Obama as good, moral, and just. And I think a visit by, let's say, a US congressperson or a senator or a vice president or one day the president, history will judge that visit to the Jeju Peace Park as good, moral, and just. In closing, in 1908, the US Congress passed an act, a bill, to allow for the US share of money that was extracted from Qing, China, for Chinese people who attacked foreign legations in 1899 and 1900 in the Boxer Uprising, so-called, in the wake of the death of foreign nationals at the hands of the Chinese, those nations concerned, 13 nations sent troops into the Qing Dynasty to China to exact revenge. And the Chinese, the Qing Dynasty was forced to pay a huge indemnity, money. A few years after that, in 1908, Congress passed a law that allowed for the U.S. share, about half, over half of what US the U.S. received, to use as scholarship for Chinese students who wish to come and study in the United States. I would very comfortably, with confidence, argue that history has judged that gesture to be good, moral, and just. Thus, if Congress one day were to take a similar step, 
similar measures and appropriated funds to allow for the victims of the Jeju April 3rd massacre to come and study in the United States, I humbly believe that history will judge that gesture to be good, moral, and just. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for shedding light on history. Just quick question. This is an ignorant question, but before we move to Ms. Yang, I, I think, you know, I, I must confess that I think very, not many people are aware of the April, 4, uh, April 3rd incident, including myself. I mean, I think U.S. policymakers, Korea Watches community, when we talk about like Gwangju uprising, many people know about it. But this incident is something that's not widely recognized or there's a very little understanding of or awareness of, knowledge of. Just quick question on, when you just compare it to something like Gwangju uprising, why is it that you think there's such so little recognition and awareness of this incident? Because the Gwangju uprising took place over the course of eight days in May 1980, and it's another horrific tragedy in modern Korean political history, but there have been charges made that the U.S. Embassy or in particular the U.S. forces, the commander of the U.S. forces in Korea, were somehow implicated, even complicit, in the disproportionate cruel use of force, the killings of protesters. Um, the two issues, in my humble opinion, are very different. The Jeju tragedy was prolonged it took really place, it took place really from March 1947 and was not resolved until seven years later in 1954, September 1954. Um, there is a qualitative difference in the role of the United States again in that during the Jeju incident, the United States military had full control over the South Korean forces. Whereas in 1980 in Gwangju, there is certainly more than plausible uh, denial. That is, there is, you know, there is plausible argument, strong argument, I would say, that the United States officials were in the dark. And one allegation always has been, a constant allegation has been, well, the United States commander held operational control over the deployment of South Korean troops. So either the U.S. commander said yes, approved it, or should be, should be you know, responsible for that move of the movement of frontline soldiers into Gwangju, battle-ready soldiers who committed these crimes. Um, not really, because Chun Duan did just that without informing the U.S. commander. He moved troops in December 1979 in the wake of Park jong ils death in October. So uh, to be... Try to be, try to be, trying to be concise. The fact that Americans don't know hardly anything about uh, Jeju does not surprise me, but it's mainly because there has never been any political need for the United States to revisit the past, thanks in much to the censorship enforced under the Syng Mun Rhee and Park Chung Hee governments in South Korea. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn to Ms. Yang now. I understand your own family has been deeply touched by these historical events. So if you could just provide your perspective and personal account, that would be great. Thank yeah. you. Uh, good afternoon. My sincere thank you to Dr. Sumit Terry and Kelly Laota and the Wilson Center for hosting this event. Also, special thanks to Oh young -un, Governor of Jeju Special Self-Governing Province and Go Hee-bum, Chairman of Jeju April Third Peace Foundation to support this event. Um, yeah, I represent Jeju April Third Memorial and Families Association of the United States. I'm a third generation victim of the Jeju massacre. Jeju Island, at the third most tip of South Korea, is the largest island in Korea with a population of 670 thousands in 2021. It is beautiful, volcanic island listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Many people go on their honeymoon to Jeju Island and currently uh, they are many Koreans who dream of living in Jeju. 
It is not easy to imagine that there is a tragedy on Jeju Island. Almost 30,000 people were massacred at the time. One-tenth of the island population were killed or disappeared. Jeju Island is a sad island for the people who live there. I would like to inform you that some survivors of Jeju massacre are still alive. They still remember the events vividly after more than 70 years have passed. When my father was eight years old on January 2nd, 1949, soldiers stormed his house in Doryeondong and took my grandfather away. My father was playing in the backyard and was not detected by the soldiers. My grandfather, Yang Sang-gyu, never returned home. He was killed along with other villagers. My grandfather was an ordinary citizen unrelated to the Workers' Party of South Korea. Both of my father's brothers, my uncles, who lived with my grandfather, were also taken away. They had no idea why they were being taken. My uncle, Yang Seok Jung, who had come, f come home from studying painting in Japan, was taken to Daegu prison. And another uncle, Yang Seok Gu, was taken to Gwangju prison. Since there were no prisons in Jeju Island at that time, many young people from Jeju were taken to prisons on the mainland. It is presumed that they were sentenced to death without legal re representation or proper trial. My uncles never came home again. My grandmother died soon after my grandfather and uncles were taken away by soldiers, so my father grew up as an orphan. Throughout his life, my father longed for his grandfather, feeling guilty about only seeing him dragged away from him. The trauma my father suffered affected to me as well. My two younger brothers and I were born in Seoul. When I finished my second grade in elementary school, my father said that we would move to Jeju Island. This surprised me. Jeju Island was only on our plane uh, right from Seoul, but it felt strange and far away. That was the first time I knew that my parents' hometown was Jeju Island. My father and mother never told me stories about their hometown. At the time, Korea was generally under development and people from all of the country were flocking to Seoul, the capital. Both of my parents are from Jeju Island. They also met and married on the island. But they moved to Seoul and had a children. In Seoul, my father owned a Western house, Western style house, and had a stable job. However, he decided to abandon his job in Seoul after 10 years and return to his hometown. He moved his family back to Jeju so that he could take care of his grave of his deceased parents, brothers, and relatives, according to the Confucian tradition. But the graves of my grandfather and two uncles were empty. <coughs> their bodies were never found. My father wanted to find their remains and redeem, redeem their honor. But I didn't hear about when and how my grandfather died until I was in middle school. At the time, <coughs> my father was afraid it be known that we were um, families of a victim of April 3rd incident. When I came to Jeju, I was the only student from Seoul in my school, Book Elementary School. And the students were curious and came to see me. Uh, they called me mainland girl because I wanted to fit in. I tried to learn Jeju dialect and to make a friend with them. Uh, one day, 
my younger brother said he wanted to become a civil servant later. My father said it would be impossible because of the guilt by association principle. The victims of the April 3rd incident and their descendants uh, labeled as the rats, so revealing that they were the April 3rd victim's family meant taking social disadvantages in the, in the 1980s in Korea, a divided country where the Cold War was still ongoing. Families of victims were tormented by guilt by association system and the national security law. So many April 3rd survivors had to hide from the outside that they were victim's family. The children of the slaughtered had to be silent. When I was young, the April 3rd incident was a taboo word. Mental scars from tortures such as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and the red complex were not healed. It. The number of victims come from the by Jeju every third committee is uh, 14,532 as of 2018 um, children under age 10 and then 2,534 young people under 20 were included and also 3,054 women were killed. This is only official number of victims. And the fact-finding report estimate the casualties at the time of the April 3rd between mm, 25,000 and then 30,000 people. At the time, more than 10th of the population of Jeju Island lost their lives. Currently, <coughs> the US government has not made any mention of the Jeju April incident. The Korean government has never raised the issue, either officially or unofficially. And the Association for the Believed Families April 3rd Victims, which claimed U.S. responsibility, visited the embassy of the United States in Seoul. The U.S. denied the responsibility for the massacre in Jeju. Like a U.S. government claims, some people say uh, the South Korean military police and the far right group were only involved and have a responsibility in Jeju massacre directly, not the United <laughs> Military Government. But that is not true. What I present no, President Sungman Lee and U.S. Lieutenant General John Hutch of U.S. military government signed executive agreement concerning internal military and security matters during the traditional period on August 24th, 1948. According to this agreement, even though the government of the Republic of Korea was is not established, the U.S. military government would continue to have operation control over both the army and the police of the Republic of Korea as long as U.S. forces remained in Korea. Such control of Korean military by U.S. military government has been confirmed in various places even after establishment of the Korean government According to a secret U.S. military report, U.S. Brigadier General William Roberts sent a letter to Minister Lee E. Bomzog of National Defense on September 29, 1948, start stating that operation control of the Korean conspiracy still rests with the commanding general of the U.S. Armed Force in Korea. And it is of the paramount importance, therefore, that all orders pertaining to operational control of the constabulary be cleared with the appropriate American advisor, 
prior to pub publica publication. The authority to exercise operational control was not a symbolic one, but a specific and direct one. On October 9, 1948, the U.S. Brigadier General Robert Urchett, Captain Trywell, the U.S. military advisor to the 5th Brigade to effectively intervene in the operation on Jeju Island. Actual Korean military operations such as troops, movement, and firing orders required the U.S. military permission which was controlled through the United States Military Advisory Group to the Republic of Korea dispatched to each subordinate unit. The 9th and 2nd Regiment which were sta stationed in Jeju Island and committed the massacre of civilians were no exception. Even in March 49, when the massacres occurred, the U.S. military had been recording the situation in the form of the daily report called the G2 report through the various information lines. However, U.S. military officials dispatched as advisors to the Jeju region at the time include Harold Fishgrund, U.S. military advisor of 9th Regiment, Regiment claimed in an interview with Korean historians and reporters in 2001 uh, that they were not present at the massacre. In various U.S. military records, there is information that will convince us that U.S. military government lead, led and supported the Jeju Island massacre. On October 22, 1948, yeah, Brigadier General reported joined the General Burgess on Jeju Island. He sent a patrol to Burgess, inst instruction him to hunt down the rebels from the Korean mainland. Okay, so time's up. So, in <laughs> conclusion, <laughs> the U.S. intervention <laughs> in Jeju Island at the time of the April 3rd massacre includes the following. First, the U.S. forces Korea commander and advisors gave order directly to the Korean police and guards and predecessor of the Republic of Korean Army. And second, the U.S. military advisors in Jeju actually conducted air and land operations. Third. U.S. military base stationed on Jeju Island delivered lo logistical support and information to Korean suppression force while managing and supervising the operation. Okay, the April 1948 Jeju incident is the biggest mass of civilians in South Korean history. It took place at the time when the United States military government in Korea governed in South Korea before established the Republic of Korea later in August. In the best interest of U.S.-South Korea relations, the U.S.-South Korea alliance and mutual cooperation and historical reconciliation, the United States should acknowledge its moral responsibility and honor the victims and their family with the statement apology. Yeah, JJ Press the Memory of Families Association of the United States to find out the truth about the Jeju April 3rd incident. We demand that they release more top secret <coughs> documents. I established an academic platform called the World in Korea to survey the danger of the state violence and the value of the human rights and peace to the American public through the April 3rd Jeju massacre will continue to conduct various academic and cultural activities in the future. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you for that very deeply personal account. Um, I think we do all sympathize with the pain and collective trauma of victims and families, and we do look ahead for genuine reconciliation and healing. Um, your comment about guilt by association is so disturbing to me because um, it just reminds me of yet another country that we're so familiar with where they exercise guilt by association. So this is kind of trigger that a little bit. Of course, I'm talking about North Korea. Um, next, we'll turn to Mr. Jong Yang, a longtime scholar of these issues and the former chairman of the Jeju Peace Foundation. He played a, cr a critical role um, in leading up to official Korean presidential <coughs> apology for the victim of the Jeju um, incident. So, Mr. Yang, please. Yeah, 감사합니다. 예, 발표에 앞서서 제가 한 분을 좀 소개하고자 합니다. 예, 그분은 사산물로 인해서 어머니, 십대 누님, 두 분의 형님, 한 가족 네 사람을 잃은 유족입니다. 오늘 새벽에 뉴욕에서 출발해서 바로 이 자리에 오신 이한진 회장님 잠시만 일어나 주십시오. 자 여러분 이루와 경례 박수 좀 부탁드립니다. 자 앉아 주십시오. 예. 저는 이분을 통해서 사삼은 끝난 역사가 아니라 현재 진행 중인 역사라고 하는. 그런 것을 몸으로 보여줬다 이렇게 생각을 합니다. 제가 이제 프리테이션을 좀 준비했는데 화면이 너무 작아서 아마 복사본이 좀 음, 여러분들이 갔습니다. 이 안쪽에 이쪽에도 좀 주세요. 예, 제주도는 한국에서 가장 큰 섬입니다. 일본, 한국, 중국 사이에 있는 전략적 요충조이기도 합니다. 이 섬에서 미군이 통치하던 미군정 시절에 참혹한 사건이 일어난 것이죠. 저는 그 뿌리는 미국과 소련이 45년 8월 전쟁이 끝나면서 그어놓은 38선 분단에 있다고 생각을 합니다. 제주도민들은 이 바로 이 분단선을 걷어내려고 48년에 실시된 단독 선거를 선거를 보이콧했다가 참혹한 학살을 당한 것입니다. 그 희생자 숫자는 한국 정부 보고서에서는 2만 5천에 3만 명으로 추정하고 있고요. 여기에 나오는 지도는 마을별의 희생자 숫자를 표시한 것으로 노영이라는 마을에서는 541명이 희생되었습니다. 400명, 300명, 200명. 아, 죄송합니다. 자, 이렇게 38선이 그어졌고요. 이 희생자 지도. 자, 이 사건은 47년 3월 1일 발표한 경찰 발표에서 시작이 됐습니다. 이날 일본 통치를 반대했던 3.1절 기념하는 집회가 있었고 경찰은 비무장 민간인들에게 발표했습니다. 경찰은 정당방위라고 주장했지만 그것은 거짓이었습니다. 희생자 6명은 초등학교 학생 젖먹이를 안고 있던 이 여인 4 0 구세난 농부 모두 구경꾼이었습니다. 경찰이 계속 정당방위라고 주장을 하자 제주도민들은 열흘 후에 총파업을 했습니다. 이 파업에는 공무원, 직장인, 학생, 상점 모두 참여했죠. 심지어 제주경찰 66명도 동참했습니다. 그 발포가 제주 경찰이 아니라 본토에서 내려온 응원 경찰을 샀기 때문입니다. 그런데 파업을 하니까 미군정은 제주 도민들을 사상적으로 의심하기 시작했습니다. 제주도를 
이른바 레드 아일랜드로 보기 시작한 것이죠. 본토에서 400명의 기, 경찰과 구구단체 서북청년단을 보내서 테러를 시작했습니다. 4.3 봉기 이전까지 2,500명의 청년들이 구속되었습니다. 자, 유치장은 차고 넘쳤죠. 그런데 양심적인 감찰관 넬슨 중령은 제주 유치장은 최악의 상태다. 10 곱하기 12피트 이런 매우 작은 공간에 35명을 가두었다는 보고서를 상부에 제출합니다. 그럼에도 개선은 되지 않았습니다. 48년 3월에 경찰이 더욱 심하게 고문을 했습니다. 한달 사이에 중학교 2학년 학생 등 3명이 고문으로 사망하는 사건이 발생했죠. 민심은 악화되었습니다. 더욱이 48년 2월부터 남한만의 단독선거가 현실화되자 전국은 요동쳤습니다. 이때 자파 세력인 남로당 제주도당 간부들이 비밀회의를 합니다. 젊은 지도자들은 무장투쟁을 주장했고 나이든 투쟁 지도자들은 우리가 맨주먹인데 어떻게 미군하고 싸우느냐 그렇게 해서 반대했습니다. 그러나 12대 7로 무장투쟁이 결정된 것이죠. 저는 이 무장투쟁은 양면성이 있다고 생각을 합니다. 탄압에 저항하고 단독선거를 반대해서 통일정부를 지향하자는 의견에는 제주 도민들도 일정하게 지지했습니다. 하지만 경찰과 응원 청년 단체만 공격하면 군인들은 중립을 지킬 것이고 미군은 국제 여론을 중시하기 때문에 개입 안할 것이라 하는 정세 판단 그것은 너무나 잘못된 것이고 착오였습니다. 48년 4월 3일 게릴라 350명이 12개 경찰 지선을 숙격하면서 4.3 봉기가 시작됩니다. 단독 선거를 반대해서 통일정부를 수립하자는 수록원을 내걸었죠. 이런 <웃음> 무장투쟁은 <웃음> 본토에서도 있었습니다. 그럼에도 제주도에서만 많은 희생자가 발생한 것은 바로 50 선거를 보이콧했기 때문입니다. 그 당시 유권자 50, 50% 이상이 투표해야만 이 인정되는 선거 제도였는데요. 전국적으로 200개 선거구에서 투표가 진행되는데 유독 제주도 2개 선거구만 50% 미만으로 선거가 무효 처리된 것입니다. 여러분 이 선거는 누가 시행한 선거일까요? <웃음> 바로 미군정이 한 것입니다. 미군정은 충격을 받았죠. 남한을 통치하던 하지 총사령관은 주각 전투사령관 브라운 대령을 제주도 총사령관으로 파견합니다. 브라운 대령은 직접 기자회견을 갖고 나는 사건의 발생한 원인에는 흥미도 없다. 나의 사명은 진압이고 조석기 재선거를 실시하겠다고 밝혔습니다. 당시 국방부 최고 고문관 로버트 중장도 제주 내로와 재선거를 동의했습니다. 미군정은 재선거를 6월 23일 날 실시한다고 공포했죠. 그런데 미군 사령관의 전략은 젊은 사람들을 선거의 방해꾼으로 여겨서 제가 있든 없든 관계없이 모조리 체포하는 것이었습니다. 6주 동안에 6천 명을 구속했습니다. 학교 운동장에 천막 수용소를 만들어서 감금한 것이죠. 이런 무차별 작전이 진행되자 많은 사람들이 산으로 갔습니다. 폭도 아닌 폭도를 만들어낸 것이죠. 자, 이 증명서가 하나 나오는데요. 
이 증명서는 중학교 2학년 학생이 것입니다. 그 내용에는 학위 서명인은 미국인과 조선인 합동 취조를 맞춰서 석방한다고 적혀 있습니다. 6월 23일 날 석방한 것이죠. 바로 미군정이 장담했던 재선거 날이었습니다. 그러나 재선거도 실패합니다. 미국 사령관들은 자존심에 큰 상처를 입었습니다. 뉴욕타임스는 2001년 10월 특집 보도를 합니다. 그때는 4.3 특별법이 <웃음> 제정되면서 한국 정부가 4.3에 대해서 진상조사를 착수할 때입니다. 이 보도기사를 보면 세 가지 중요한 키워드가 있습니다. 첫째는 제주도가 유일한 선거 보일 곳. 두 번째는 미군 사령관들이 분노, 붕괴했대. 세 번째는 섬 주민들을 대상으로 청소하는 작전을 착수했다는 것입니다. 청소하는 작전 무엇일까요? 쓸어버리는 겁니다. 바로 뉴욕타임스의 보도 기사이죠. 자, 초토화 작전은 해안선에서 5km 이상 떨어진 산악 지대를 폭도 지역 적재로 간주해서 모조리 쓸어버리는 작전 개념입니다. 이 지역은 지도에서 보듯이 제주도의 80%의 넓은 지역이었습니다. 첫째는 남녀 노소 가리지 않고 학살했습니다. 소말 돼지 가축들을 없앴고요. 세 번째는 민가 사만 여체를 불태웠습니다. 바로 이때 엄청난 피해가 발생된 것이죠. 자, 여러분 비무장 민간인들을 현장에서 사살하는 이런 작전은 국제법에서 용납되지 않습니다. 한국 정부 진상 보고서에서도 초토화 작전의 책임을 세분되는 것입니다. 첫 번째는 한국. First is the leaders of the Korean Army. This is the Korean Army Chief of Staff, Byung Dok Choi, who paid a visit to Jeju, and then Regimental Commander Yong Chun Sun led the eradication operation. Second is ROK President Lee Seung Man, who declared martial law over Jeju. The cabinet meeting records of those days show that he ordered a ruthless crackdown on Jeju incident. In order to get more support and aid from the U.S., what does it mean? The U.S. command urged a quick conclusion of the Jeju uprising, and he's faithfully responded to such requests. The third party accountable is the U.S. leaders. When the Republic of Korea was founded in August 1948, U.S. military advisory group had the right of operation of the Korean armed forces led by General William Roberts. A letter written by General Roberts to the Minister of Defense of Korea was found, and it was dated December 18, 1948, right after the entire island of Jeju was set on fire and burned to the ground. In the letter, he said, Regimental Commander Song did a wonderful job as a leader. Make sure to announce it in a presidential statement. Three days later, the chief of staff of the Korean army, Che, responded by saying, Lieutenant Song and U.S. advisor to Jeju proved their competency in Jeju. As you suggested, presidential statement will be made and General Song will be decorated. Here, I'd like to point out that all the equipment, weapons, and bullets used in the eradication campaign and reconnaissance planes were supplied from the U.S. Army in Korea. All these indicate the involvement of the U.S. forces in the ruthless operation. 
The April 3rd uprising has been banned from public discussion for half a century. It was suppressed and branded as communist rebellion. These are those people who were arrested for making investigations into the uprising or rising or writing a novel on it, despite hard censorship during those days. All the suppressions could not stop people from making efforts to ascertain the truth. In 1998, making the 50th anniversary of April 3rd, there was a street demonstration asking for a legislation of a special act on April 3rd. Local councils, family members of the victims, and civil organizations joined the demonstration. Later in 2000, special act on April 3rd was enacted, and then President Kim Dae-jung invited those who made it possible to the Blue House. Here, you can see to the right, the second to the right is Director Go or Chairman Go, who made a speech at the beginning, and right behind the president is me. Three year government investigations ensued to come to a conclusion that the government infringed upon the human rights in Jeju. Later, in 2003, President Noomyeon made an apology. President Noh was the first South Korean president to apologize for the 1948 massacre. This sparked reconciliation movement among people living in Jeju. They started to see the event from a different perspective. Before the milestone apology, they thought it was an internal conflict between resident groups living in Jeju or conflict between Jeju populace against those from the mainland. However, the truth revealed that April 3rd is an outcome of the conflict on the Korean Peninsula or the Cold War. We started to see it with the history, world history in its background to realize that the weak and helpless suffer when the big powers collide. So they started to ask leaders to take responsibility for what was done and happened, and then consider those killed as victims. Later in 2013, something miraculous happened. The Victim Family Representatives and the Police Friendship Association of Jeju announced a joint statement that they reached a reconciliation. After that, they have held joint respect or worship ceremony to the victims on August 2nd every year. They started to pay their respect together at the Chunghon Cemetery where the spirit of soldiers and police officers were enshrined and the April 3rd Park where memorial tablets of the victims of the 4-3 incident are held. Not only the two groups, but also heads of different organizations, representative of the ruling and opposition party, joined such movement. The now progressive and conservative, the ruling and opposition parties and private and government now come together in Jeju Island to join the journey for healing from the April 3rd incident. That's not all. Many projects are already underway to restore the honor of the victims. In particular, with, with the amendment of the Special Act for April 3rd put into force last year, the government started to grant compensation of $70,000 per victim. Those people who were imprisoned at the time of the incident are now being acquitted one after another. The government fact-finding and trauma, trauma healing project have been rolled out. Besides, there have been four presidential apologies, including the ones made by President Noh Mu Hyun and Moon Jae-in. Incumbent President Yoon Song Yeol also promised to do his best to restore the honor of the victims. Justice is being served. Jeju April 3rd is now presenting itself as a model to show how wrongdoings of the past could be reserved. The remains, what remains unreserved until now, what is that? That is the role, responsibility, and position of the U.S. 
Back in 2003, after the April 3rd study meeting was held at Harvard University, there were several events taking place asking the U.S. government to make clear its position on this matter. Three years ago, in 2019, the April 3rd symposium was held at the UN headquarters in New York, where the issue of the U.S. responsibility was discussed. And there was also a resolution made to hold such an event in Washington, D.C., too. However, COVID-19 was in our way, but finally, we have this symposium here today in the presence of you. Charles Rangel, a former congressman and also a congressman of the U.S., attended the event, said, I'm a veteran of Korean War. The Korean-U.S. alliance has become stronger than ever over the years. Historic issues such as Jeju, April 3rd, must also be reserved with honesty in order to take our relation to another level. That's what he said, exactly. We are not doing this to remain stuck in the past. I believe that today's event is meaningful in that it can further strengthen the relationship between Korea and the U.S. and help us resolve the problems of the past with honesty and move forward for a better future. Ladies and gentlemen, please help. Thank you. So I think it's pretty clear that he's been a long-time scholar of this historical issue. Thank you so much for this very comprehensive and thorough presentation. So we're not going to turn to Ambassador Stevens. Ambassador Stevens, you have been a, a special and dear friend um, to the South Korean people. Um, in your three different tours to Korea, right, as a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Korea and teacher, a tour in the uh, as a political officer uh, in the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, um, really focused on reporting on Korea's domestic political and human rights issues. Your um, your U.S. In, in Busan, right. Um, and of course, U.S. Ambassador to South Korea as a first Korean speaker, I believe, um, in your studies in Korean language and culture. Um, we'll just love your thoughts now from everything you've heard, uh, your perspective on what you've just heard. And, but also broadening it out a bit, um, what would you say are some of the main issues in U.S. rock bilateral relations? And in terms of you know so much about the Korean people, how would you qualify the Korean character, resilience, the perseverance? A little comment on that would be also great. Ambassador Stevens. Gosh, well, thank you. I think Dr. Terry Sumi, I, uh, I feel, uh, even after that, that <laughs> or especially after that introduction, completely inadequate to follow these very thoughtful and moving uh, presentations that we've heard already this morning. But I am honored to share the stage with all of you, and if I may say, to be back in person at the Wilson Center again. And I would associate and second the remarks you made at the beginning, Sue, about um, what you try to do here at the Wilson Center. I remember a few years ago, it seems like a long, long time ago because it was pre-pandemic, when I was here in this auditorium when we talked about the 1980s, and I did live in Korea uh, uh, for six years in the 1980s, and Korean democratization. And uh, my sense then that the, doing those oral histories, doing some in Korea as well, sharing with our Korean colleagues both our, our memories of the time. Uh, I, I don't have personal memories, obviously none of us do, and this is why it's very challenging, but we appreciate the personal uh, testimonies as painful as they are that we've heard. Um, but I think it's extremely valuable uh, f for all the reasons that have already been stated, uh, but also going forward. Uh, to, to ensure that we continue to deepen and strengthen uh, our, our bonds and our understanding and our work together. Um, I have to say I do have a, a, I feel I have a special tie to Jeju-do. I'm sure probably everyone in this room feels like they do because it's not a place that you visit and forget. Um, I did first go there in, I think, 1976. Uh, and uh, I actually spent my last two two weeks in uh, in Korea, and I haven't told this story before. And sorry to be in, in 1977 before I left Korea for the first time, uh, in Sogipo, uh, in a uh, a farm village uh, where I think there's a giant hotel now. Of course, that could be anywhere, but uh, uh, but I always think of that every time I go back to Jeju-do. And uh, I have uh, 
been lucky enough to go back to Jeju-do over the years. Uh, you'll hear from some speakers uh, this afternoon, John Merrill, uh, uh, who he and I visited together in the 1980s, and of course, Dr. Moon Jung-in, and thanks to him, I've been going back a number of times, even post-ambassadorship, uh, to the Jeju Peace Forum, which I think is, a, a, as m most of you probably know, an international uh, forum held every year in Jeju-do, which brings together people to talk about a whole range of issues, but I think also serves to highlight the special role that, that the island of Jeju has and the people of Jeju have uh, in our work together and in the world. Um, so I, I, I'm glad to join this, and I'm not a scholar, but I do think as a, as a student and still a student of Korean history uh, for many, many years uh, and of the U.S.-Korea relationship, I, I think that a lot of Americans, even those who uh, know a lot about Korea in many ways, uh, kind of mark the history of U.S.-Korean relations from maybe from June 25th, 1950, and the period before is uh, a bit uh, understudied. Uh, and in particular, the difficult period between liberation uh, in 1945 and, and the years that followed, uh, I think is, is relevant to understanding the complexity of our relationships. And so as painful as it can be, uh, I, I, I welcome the fact that uh, this panel and all of you here today uh, are, are ready to confront it. Um, I just had really a, a few comments. I don't know if I can talk much about, maybe later in our, 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 in our Q's and A's about the U.S.-Korea relationship, but a couple of comments on, on, on what I heard uh, today when I moved to say. Um, one is, uh, and Ms. Young, I really appreciate your, your testimony and your mentioning as, uh, of the, the guilt by association, uh, you said principle, it was a law, I guess. And... Um, and I think we, we, all of us, kind of forget that. Maybe some of us forget it because you were too young to remember. Um, but, you know, when I lived in Korea, and again, this is just personal testimony as a foreigner uh, with, you know, very modest Korean language skills, but in the 1970s and the 1980s, so people didn't talk about a lot of things. I mean, I think there was a collective trauma. We use that a, a lot these days, which I did not recognize in many ways at the time as a young American there. Uh, in a country that was determinedly trying to move forward and determinedly not like trying not to look back, but there was also, as you say, censorship or worse, and and uh, the notion of guilt by association was was written into the law, and it really occurred to me how important this was actually, and this is one of the fortunate things I had about going back to Korea a number of times with with absences in between. As ambassador, when I was there as ambassador, uh, and this was probably in 2010, I believe. I took advantage of my position in many ways, but one was I invited people who were retired but I had, and who had been t t way too senior for me to know back in the 1980s, but would in their retirement years graciously come to lunch at the ambassador's residence, and I would ask them about mm -hmm. their thoughts. And I, I'm not sure I should name the person, but you probably, I, I hosted a former prime minister who had held many senior positions in the South Korean government in the 70s and 80s, many positions. And, and I asked him, what are you most proud of? I mean, honestly, there are probably some things he wasn't very proud of. It's probably true of all of us, but it was a difficult time. And he said to me, the thing that I'm most proud of is that during my tenure, we got rid of the guilt by association law. Mm. That was the 1980s. Now, for some of us, that's not, not so long ago. And ever since then, to get back, I, I've thought, you know, when I read about, when I hear the testimony from, from people coming from North Korea, and I hear why they came, many times they talk about guilt by association. And I thought, you know, that is a human rights issue that was addressed, but very much alive and very much affected the families of Jeju, and maybe psychologically still hangs over, and something that we, we, we need to keep in mind uh, when we talk about, about, about human rights in North Korea. So... Uh, but yes, I, I, I saw the burden myself of maybe your parents' generation, and, and I think it's continued uh, to, to weigh very heavily. With all that said, I also want to say how much I admire um, the courage and the rigor of people like Ms. Young, Mr. Young, and others who are here in, in continuing to research and present the evidence and try to uh, uh, have an honest discussion about, uh, about those terrible days and about their aftermath. Um, 
again, we can talk about, and I don't know what the answer is. I don't work for the U.S. government anymore as to what kind of official statements should be made or gestures should be made. I mean, certainly, I think uh, uh, those of us who have served in Korea have tried to do our part, understanding the important role, the key role that the United States has played. I hope mostly for good, but, but sometimes it's been a very complicated and difficult relationship. Um, but also recognizing the complexity of it to, to try to contribute to reconciliation in, uh, in the Republic of Korea and to contribute to a, a, a more honest and, st and strong relationship across the board, across the board with the people of the Republic of Korea. But you know, how do, I'm sure we've had some missed opportunities and we have work to do ahead. I was recalling uh, when uh, Professor Lee mentioned that um, uh, that that I guess no serving <laughs> or, you know, that you know, you're suggesting a, a presidential visit to Shejido, I think. Um, I remember in, I wasn't there, but in 1996, uh, President Bill Clinton visited Shejido and had a summit meeting with then President Kim Yong Sam. And uh, actually, as I was uh, getting ready for this this morning, you can see, I, I looked on my phone, I looked up uh, to check the date. It was April 1996 when uh, President Clinton stopped in Shejido and had this summit. And the focus then was, again, this is 1996, so in the midst of trying to move forward with the work with North Korea under the agreed framework, and uh, they had a press conference. So I just looked over the press conference. The press conference is all about the agreement to have four party talks with North Korea, so North and South Korea, China, and the U.S. Um, and, uh, and that was a worthy endeavor. Like a lot of worthy endeavors, it didn't work out. It failed, and that work goes on. Uh, but I thought maybe it was a sign of the times that there was no mention of the need for reconciliation uh, within the Republic of Korea itself. Now, this is work that I think the Korean people in South Korea have done very steadily. And uh, for example, I did not know about the 2013 meeting, which happened after I was ambassador there, and, and that, that shows this effort to kind of keep moving forward. But the U.S. can and should be appropriately a part of that. And I think that's the work that we all need to think about going forward because I think what the thing that pains me as someone who's witnessed so much in South Korea, it's extraordinary, not only economic but democratic rise, is that um, the, uh, the modern virus, and I'm not talking about uh, COVID, but the modern virus of polarization and partisanship uh, I think threatens all of us in a way. And we see it on issues like this. And there is a need for whether the word is reconciliation or finding some common ground I think is, uh, is stronger than ever. And finally, I, I guess I would say what I was thinking about 19, 1996 when uh, President Clinton and Kim Jong-sam met in Jeju-do, and there's actually a beautiful picture of them I've, uh, walking across one of the yellow fields of Jeju. I, I know someone in the White House is very proud of that picture because they, they, they composed that picture. These are, these are big pieces, and yes, the big symbolic steps can be important. But I was actually at that time uh, living in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I was about midway through a four-year effort I was involved in uh, for reconciliation and a more permanent peace regime in the north of Ireland and, and in, uh, in between Ireland and, 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 and the UK. And again, the US, I think for historical reasons, in some ways had an interest and tried to play a constructive part in that. And I was, um, I was thinking about, now this will be my final little comment here, um, I was thinking about uh, a poem I would recommend, the, 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 the interpreters may not like this, but a poem I would recommend to you by a, po a poet from Northern Ireland, Seamus Haney, who uh, I think won the Nobel Prize. And uh, he wrote it in 1975, and, and it's, uh, the title of the poem is Say Nothing, or Whatever You Say, Say Nothing. And a part of the poem is about that, and I think it gets to what Ms. Young was talking about, that we have to make sure that we say something. But the poem is, where to be saved, and this is where to be saved, you only must save face, and whatever you say, say nothing. We do have to say something, and I really welcome this gathering today as a time to, to say something. Thank you, Ambassador Stevens. Uh, as you mentioned, this issue truly has been is under, an understudied, I think is the word you used. Um, and the conversation for research, honest discussion. I think these are first steps, and I'm glad we're doing it. We only have now, well, we do have about 18 minutes for <laughs> Q&A, so I can open it up for discussion. If anybody have any questions, um, just raise your hand. I do think we have microphones that are <coughs> going around. 
any takers, questions? Well, maybe we'll turn to Dr. Lee first. Um, I, well, so, you know, I guess the, pa the question that I want to ask the panel is where, okay, we, we first step, as I said, is to have a conference like this, to have an honest conversation, to learn. I, I admitted myself that I, you know, <coughs> this is not an area that I know much about, or, and I think this is also true for many, many Americans. So this is why we're having conference like this, to have an honest conversation. But what are the next steps beyond that? What are we trying to achieve? I mean, realistically speaking, you know, we talked about U.S. trying to have some sort of official statement. I don't think right now at this stage it's a realistic um, um, perspective just, be, just because I think, that, again, the issue has not been even, I don't think many people know about it as much as so what, uh, maybe we'll start with Dr. Lee, like what, what, where do we go from here in this context in terms of next steps? What are we trying to achieve? Why we give audience time to ask, think about some questions. Well, every historical issue of great sensitivity like this takes time to raise awareness on. It takes time to represent the facts and the truth. It takes time to cajole, compel, persuade neutral parties, especially governments, to take interest in such sensitive issues. So the journey is long, but I truly believe beyond the all-important <coughs> consideration of healing and reconciliation on the part of the victims and their families, I truly believe that in the long term that the U.S. Republic of Korea bilateral relationship, the ironclad alliance, so-called, will become diamond-clad, will become much tougher, much stronger, much closer if the U.S. government, in some capacity, showed some compassion and respect. We can start with maybe a low-level person, say, visiting the Jeju Peace Park, we can start maybe perhaps with somebody at the U.S. Embassy in Seoul making a principled remark in solidarity with the victims. I don't think it's reasonable to expect an official apology at this time. These things take time. President Obama's visit to Hiroshima took time, much dialogue between the two sides, but maybe our special conference today at the Wilson Center can be a catalyst, the start of this long journey. So while I don't think it's reasonable to expect tremendous change anytime soon, I think we can start by taking a major step today. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else want to comment on that? on the next step forward, um, what you expect to achieve as Mr. Yang. I see a uh, hand in the audience. Yeah. Um, but let me let him answer that, and then we'll, we'll get to it in one second. Because Mr. Yang. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a uh, conference uh, like this, we feel like we are shooting eggs against the strong rocks. So many people have pessimism because this rock is so solid and so strong. Despite that, even if it is a yeah, small struggle, we shouldn't stay still. We should uh, influence all the NGOs, government, all the conscientious scholars. We should start speaking to those people we, are, we, we want to appeal to the conscience of the U.S. Back in 2000, 1999, there was a Nogunni incident in Korea. And AP Press had an investigative report, and that was a major change, and it resulted in the Bill Clinton issuing a, a statement for, on that incident. And what, so we don't know which will serve as a catalyst, but as long as we just keep going, making efforts, 
I think there will be a, uh, an opportunity that will generate a catalyst. All right, so we're not, we, we will take step-by-step -step approach so that we will uh, share this, uh, the truth and uncover what really happened at that time. Thank you for your comment. Hello, I'm Oh Im Jong. I'm the representative of the bereaved, bereaved families. We have uh, the victims' family, uh, over 900, 130,000 people. So first, I'd like to thank all those people who made this uh, conference uh, possible. What I'd like to tell you today is that we want to talk about future. Bef we had all these tragedy 70 years ago. Like my parents never mentioned this incident whatsoever because we lost four family members. It's just one day. So next year, it will be a 74th anniversary. But they never mentioned this once, even once. But I'd like to talk about the future of our Korea and the relationship between the two countries. So Mr. Yang just mentioned the Nogunli incident. And AP uh, press release uh, played a role. And the US started the investigation into the like, fact-finding in in investigations. And Clinton issued a uh, apology. And I think this is the right path that we should take for Jeju uh, for 3 And we need to have uh, in enough discussion here and the U.S. I would like to. I, dem I demand the U.S. to start an investigation, and the U.S. president should issue an apology, and we should step towards to the future together, and that's the way we should resolve, uh, forge a solution. Our victim, the victim community, is determined not to pass on these pain and suffering to our uh, next generation. For that to happen, we need to talk about the future so that we will never, ever repeat the same uh, mistake we've ma we made before. And only then we can contribute to the reconciliation on the world stage. So I think we should um, work together for that to happen. So I demand the U.S. government to start the fact-finding and issue an apology so that we can move forward. Our Dr. moderator has, has offered to graciously translate to our English speakers. Dr. Terry has ordered me to do it, so... Um, graciously offered. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name. My name is... Im Ojong, I'm the chairman of the Association of the Bereaved Families of the Jeju Sazam April 3rd incident. Today there are over 130,000 family members of the victims of the Jeju massacre who are living in South Korea and beyond, here in the United States as well, as you see. Chairman Yang Jo-hun mentioned the Nogunli massacre, which took place in the fog of war, in the Korean War. And this incident, as many of you know, refers to the mass killing of well over 200 unarmed South Koreans who were hiding under a bridge, killing by American soldiers. And in the wake of the Associated Press reporting on this terrible event, the world took notice. President Clinton, the sitting president at the time, took notice and delivered a statement of regret. And that did a lot to alleviate the hurt feelings in South Korea. So perhaps this is not a leap, not totally unrealistic, that with sustained effort in raising awareness on the Jeju incident, that we may one day hope it leads to the U.S. president taking notice of this dark chapter in U.S.-Korea relations and issue a statement of either apology or regret. I think this would take our bilateral relationship to another level of closeness and friendship. Thank you. I apply Dr. Lee's incredible memory and translation skills. John. Yeah. <laughs>
Thanks. My name is John Merrill. Um, I think you have to be realistic in what you attempt to achieve. I th just before coming over here, I was watching a movie on Netflix. It was called A Night in Paradise. It's kind of a mix of a gangster movie <laughs> uh, set in, in, in Chejudo. Uh, and I, I'd recommend it to you. And the, the heroine is a dying female uh, star. Um, but um, most Americans don't know anything next to zero. Uh, this is in response to the comment that was just made about Sheju. So y you've got a very heavy load to lift in raising consciousness. Uh, right now, I don't see any consciousness of this among the American public in general, despite the efforts such as Sumi is making in this seminar. One of the things that I think you should put your efforts to is the U.S. military. They were the ones, as has been pointed out in the last panel, who had operational control. How come the military hasn't owned up to what it was doing on Chejudo during those years? Another thing I would say, which hasn't been mentioned, and which I didn't put into my paper, which I'll be presenting in a little while, is that we speak about Chejudo too much as a sui generis, a unique event. Chejudo was one of a series of popular uprisings that flourished almost like bamboo sprouts after a spring rain in the aftermath of the end of colonialism in Asia following World War II. You had the same thing happening in Southeast Asia. You had something similar happening in Taiwan where Chiang Kai-shek moved in and promptly, as his first step, massacred the entire leadership of native Taiwanese. And to this day, there's still hard feelings in Taiwan about that. Uh, so I think it would be useful, maybe through the Cheju Peace Museum, to host some events about the April 3rd uprising in historical perspective and try to see if you can raise consciousness throughout the region about what happened in Chejudo. Uh, it's, it's very striking when you read these histories of some of these rebellions. Even Vietnam could be construed as something of the sort, uh, an attempt by indigenous populations to resist the forcible reimposition of colonial structures in the aftermath of World War II. So anyway, I think you have an enormous amount of consciousness raising, and uh, I applaud Sumi for organizing this conference and maybe bringing some <clears throat> awareness to Washington, D.C., and uh, but it's going to be a very heavy lift. And uh, I don't think, uh, speaking, I'm a f I formerly worked at the State Department as an analyst, not as a Foreign Service officer, but I think if you randomly picked 100 people outside the door of C Street, cafeteria and ask them what they knew about the Chejido uprising, you might be lucky if you got one to say something about it. It's kind of a forgotten, unknown episode, very tragic episode in American history. Uh, so hopefully we can get into this a little bit more this afternoon. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. 
No, there was some lady behind you. Oh, thank you for your talk today. Uh, my name is Ashley Wu, and I am a professor at Gettysburg College. And I'm happy to share that I got the opportunity to teach about two Koreas uh, at the college for the first time. And, and um, it, as John just mentioned, it is true that many American young students do not know about this. And I myself learned a lot as I was preparing for my course. So my question is, what would you want young American college students to know and remember about this incident? And how would you, um, what would you suggest as a good approach to introduce this topic in a constructive way? That's great. Uh, I'm going to take last remaining questions, and I'll give each panelist a chance to answer. Is there any other question? You had a no. Go ahead. I want to say something. Sure. Go ahead. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then I'm going to have the panelists answer her question and say whatever they want to say as a final remark. Oh, I'm Korean Association president in Maryland. And also, I'm Governor Hogan's uh, uh, commissioner in education chair. Uh, Is it nepotism involved here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, as a Korean, is a, 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 I, I'm really interesting about the uh, sasam. Uh, I want to say about the, my education uh, background. I came. Uh, I learned. Uh, no, it's during the time education in the elementary school is until finish the university. I have a one Korean president. I learn about the anti-communist communist <laughs> whole life. Uh, only for the after I graduate, uh, then is a uh, change to the president. So it's uh, my life is the only anti-communist education, but. I never heard about the first four point three about this. I met one of the, my friends is the, behind the Mr. Yang. Then I learned about the uh, the four three. So it's a, we have a event for the some uh, four three concert. So oh, <laughs> this is the I'm very wondering about the America. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, the America is the human right is to insist the very hardly. How the communist? I think it's the only the communist did the, to kill the uh, the peoples. But how to the American soldiers can the Korean people is the kill by the the, the that is the politically was what what happened to the very seriously. The, the many Korean peoples is uh, died. How could American military? Yeah, be uh, uh, yeah. This, uh, okay. American is uh, always the insist about the human right, right? So it's yeah. a, but it's the very it's a long life is the past, but they never say to the story about the Korean government. So I think is we need. Uh, I'm now is I'm citizen. So, so we must have to the Korean peoples, and we must to work for the Korean I know American government to must be a sorry to the Korean government and Korean fam, Korean four, three families. Okay, thank you. If we don't have any, oh, John has is a two finger, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I think. She makes a very good point. Uh, there's a Here, there's a microphone. Is this on? Yes. Um, I decided not to include it in my paper, which I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. But um, in recent years, Jeju-do has become very militarized. There's a big South Korean naval base there uh, with Aegis-class warships coming in occasionally. And this is obviously an effort by the United States and, and South Korea to 
have a position of strength to project force towards mainland China. But one of the things we should be worrying about looking ahead is not just resolving old historical events which st still are lingering, <clears throat> but new ones that could pop up like nuclear war. And uh, South Korea is now considering going nuclear because mo mostly out of peak at what North Korea has been doing, they have about 100 bombs worth of nuclear material right now. But we could have another even bigger tragedy on Jeju-do if there is a nuclear war between the two Koreas. And unfortunately, Korea's, excuse me, Jeju-do is going to get it if that happens because it is a very tempting target. And uh, I just wanted to mention that fact that people should consider looking to the here and now, not just to resolve old historical problems, but to prevent new ones from occurring. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you, John. So if we don't have any other question, comment, we'll turn to the panelists for quick... So the question, so I hope the students learn to um, Korean modern history before and after liberation in 1945 with a lot of basic um, fundamental knowledge and have one to objective approach to the conflict Korean history, including the U.S. role in many things. So they can learn more uh, intensive knowledge uh, to human rights issue through the April 3rd Jeju massacre. And then I want to one more add a comment. Uh, chairman of Gohibam of um, April 3rd Foundation, Peace Foundation said several months ago when I interviewed with him for the World in Korea English Journal. So he said in resolving historical issue, there are four stages. First, fact-finding. Second, bring the culprits to justice. Third, compensation to the victims. And fourth, restoring honor to the victims. But um, in America, I think education can be start first step. Yeah, that is very important. OK. Thank you. So we're uh, here from the rest of you. Um, just mindful of a few questions that John Merrill raised. His point about Americans knowing zero. I mean, that's why education, this is the first step. And the interesting point about the U.S. military, sort of talking to the U.S. military because they are the ones who had the operational control. Um, you, your idea about hosting events like this in Jeju, maybe you could comment on that, that puts the 4-3 incident in historical perspective. Um, and then, of course, if anybody else wants to also comment on that, what do we tell the young students, right? And your, your comment about how can something like this happen when the U.S. is so focused on human rights and so on. So we'll turn to Dr. Lee first, and then Dr. Young and Ambassador Stevens will have the last word. Dr. Th Lee. Thank you for your question, and thank you, Professor Wu, for your question. Um, in academia, at least, we strongly support freedom of speech, inquiries into very sensitive material, including the past, and we come to acknowledge and sympathize with the victims of mass atrocities all around the world. The fact that Jeju is primarily known, is primarily associated with attractive images as a very nice place to visit for the tourist, for anyone, and has not been tainted by the indelible association of the place of massacre, like Nanjing, like many cities in Ukraine today, My Lai massacre in Vietnam, is a double-edged sword. It's good and also not so good. 
the fact that the rest of the world knows so little about this subject <clears throat> and views Jeju as mostly a happy place is both a good thing and also something to ponder on further. So in the United States, you know, American soldiers say in the late 19th century massacring Filipinos, there is no denial. People can have some differences of opinion, but we fully acknowledge that. We fully acknowledge that American soldiers killed hundreds of Vietnamese civilians, not only in My Lai, but other cities as well. We fully acknowledge that American soldiers tortured Iraqis. We fully acknowledge that American soldiers killed unjustly, unlawfully, nationals in Syria, in Afghanistan. But when it comes to Jeju, there is pervasive ignorance and a lack of desire for inquiry, for establishing the truth. So I think in order to encourage young students to take interest in these issues, perhaps try to place this particular subject in the broad context of war crimes or human rights violations, <coughs> crimes against humanity, which rage on, rage on today in other parts of the world. But that doesn't mean that we should not talk about this massive episode in Korean history and in the history of US-South Korea bilateral relationship. The reason that Americans don't know much about this issue is because we don't, we've not talked about it in the public, in our schools in the United States. And the fact that Americans committed such deeds in overseeing scorched earth policy, burning down entire towns, killing children, I guess not to defend such actions, Americans saw it perhaps necessary, led by the misbelief, the wrong view, that they were helping the South Korean forces quell a communist uprising throughout the Jeju Island. It sounds somewhat absurd to me today, many years after the fact, but the containment of communism was <coughs> the priority goal for the United States of America. And in the name of quelling communism, mass atrocities were committed and condoned. So, yeah. <coughs> I agree. I cannot agree more. Before I started to study the April 3rd, I thought that human rights is utmost importance to the U.S. The U.S. is a democratic country, one of the leaders of our democratic policies. But once I started to study the April 3rd, I realized that U.S. has another side the other side that I didn't know. Since the beginning of the Cold War in that era, we have a conflict between the right and left. Everything was divided into two. So to the party who is branded a communist, we had a harsh approach and decided to crack down. For the April 3rd, the U.S. didn't try to appease the populace of the Jeju people. They just relied on the physical force to crack down on the opposition. That's what they did during the May 1st demonstration and the ensuing uprising. There was a possibility that everything could be reserved in peace, but they took the wrong path. So when we have a look at the history, we have to look at the same country can do something right, but they can do something wrong too. So from April 3rd, what we can learn? There can be many lessons that we can learn, but over the past 50 years, the truth was hidden, the buried. We just started to dig it and try to have or reveal the truth of the painful memories and now, by uncovering that, we are setting on the journey toward the healing and reconciliation. So I think that we just set on the right path. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, no, I've really been very moved by so much of what I've heard today. You know, um, to you, America seldom lives up to its ideals, and that's not that's not only the case in Korea or in our own country here, but throughout the world. And if there's any kind of saving quality, it's it's our democracy, if we can sustain it. And by our democracy, it is our freedom of speech, not only in academia, but that in our societies. And as a government, we can look, look and try to look honestly at what has happened. And as a free society, engage in thinking about what happened and what we do about it and how we go forward. But no, we don't live up to our ideals. Um, and, you know, in terms of what can be done, I, I, I say with all respect, I don't think there's any one step that, that the United States or, for that matter, the Korean government you know, can take that's going to assuage, that's going to comfort all of the pain and all the hurt and all the wrong. Um, I do think it's step by step. It's not to say that important, difficult things cannot be done, but it's step by step. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that that is the approach that Chairman Yang and, and others you have taken um, to get this far, uh, to get to a place where we can have a conference like this, where we can have this conversation, where you have the Korean government uh, across the political spectrum recognize uh, that this needs to be addressed in some way, although there still may be disagreement about what needs to be done. And so finally, I guess I would say within that context, and I mean, your question's a great one. What do we want the next generation to know? And yeah, we have to be realistic. I mean, we're all barraged with information about history and about, uh, about the, the cruel present. Uh, what do we expect people to carry with them? I welcome the fact that you're teaching a class about the two Koreas, that you're looking at it. And probably those students you're training, and maybe some of them will become diplomats or go into the military or do something else that... I, I hope you're giving, I'm sure you are, giving them that kind of framework to think about, this is a complicated relationship. I mean, a lot of bad stuff happened. They may not remember the details. I hope they'll remember Jejudo. But we, they have to come with a resolve that we have to find a way to balance the, the, the human rights dimensions, uh, the, the nature of American power, the nature of an alliance with all of our ideals. I, I, that's what we need our teachers for. That's what we need these things for. But I, I don't take it as a measure of, of if, you know, taking a poll of people and saying, do you know what day this happened? It's, it has to be a deeper thing than that. And I do think that Jeju and the meaning of Jeju-do, in addition to remembering and respecting the suffering and the, tra and the sacrifice of people there, is, is to serve a larger goal. And here's my last example. I said, I was uh, in Jeju-do again uh, in like 2000, I think, 11, and, and uh, Professor Moon jung in was there too. And we saw a group of about 20 students from throughout Asia and the United States building what they called a peace park, a tiny little park, not the main, main peace park, but a little peace park on the shore of Jeju-do. They spent two weeks under this very hot sun building this little park. It's still there. I visited. But what the Jeju government then did is they invited back every year people from this peace park movement. Because there's a peace park in Vladivostok. There's a peace park in Juarez. There's a peace park in San Diego. So that kind of spirit of Jeju, and if you can get some comfort from the idea that that spirit of Jeju, those students went back understanding very well what happened in Jeju. But they also took with them a sense that they need to bring these lessons elsewhere. So it is step by step, and I think we all have to be a part of it. Thank you. I think that's the last word because you just said it so beautifully. Um, we started this conference a little late, so we're running about 15 minutes behind. But we're now, with that, take a break for 10 minutes, go grab coffee, um, a quick break, and then we'll regroup for panel two and continue this conversation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to resume our discussion with the start of our second session. Where's uh, Moon, Professor Moon? He's here. That, um, oh, he is? Okay. Okay. A lot of people are still you know, in okay. the hallway. So.
Well, thank you for joining us for our second session. I have the honor of serving as the moderator for this panel. You have, again, the full bios of the speakers. I'll be very brief in introducing Dr. John Merrill, very famous old Korea Han, old as in <laughs> with tradition and you know historical records. Old in all senses. Um, for many years, Dr. Merrill was the head of the State Department, U.S. State Department Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Just a small section of that. <laughs> uh, you are an institution by yourself. Uh, Dr. Merrill is an old Korea hand, a true expert, a true expert on this subject as well. Uh, he's written a marvelous um, journal article or two or more on the Jeju massacre itself. So we're delighted that Dr. Merrill can join us today. And then we have Dr. Charles Kraus, who is a deputy, the deputy director at the Wilson Center of the Center's History and Public Policy Program. Dr. Kraus is an expert in various fields, including modern Chinese history, Cold War history, international history, on urban resettlement of over 12,000 Chinese youth to Xinjiang, on refugee movement, Russians to India and beyond. So Dr. Kraus, we are delighted that you can join us today to shed light on the international context of uh, the first years of the Cold War. And then third, uh, we are joined by Dr. Ho, Ho Jun Ho, who is a reporter, a full-time reporter for a major newspaper, a daily paper in South Korea called the Hangyore. He is also the head of research at the Jeju April 3rd Research Institute. And he earned his doctoral degree in political science from Jeju National University and wrote what sounds to me like a fascinating topic. He wrote his dissertation on a comparative study of the Jeju April 3rd incident and the Greek Civil War. So we're delighted that you could make the trip to be here with us today, Dr. Ho. Before I ask um, John, Dr. Merrill, to start, may I just say, since I see Ambassador Stevens uh, in the back, who is still here, I know you have to go in a few minutes. Um, I remember, well, first a little, a little bit of self-touting, bragging. When I first met Ambassador Stevens in October 2005 at a KEI-sponsored seminar at the University of Washington, she was the luncheon speaker as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. She was so dazzling, I did something I've, I'd never done before and since have not either. I just went up to her and said, you are the next U.S. ambassador to South Korea. <laughs> Three years later, my prediction came true. <laughs> and as the ambassador, when I greeted her after some two, two or three years, I said to her, Madam Ambassador, I feel like a prophet, like a fortune teller. The more important <clears throat> point here is that the venue where I saw Kathleen Stevens as the sitting U.S. ambassador was in January 2009, at the Kimgu Museum and Library in Hyochang Park in Seoul. Kimgu, as many of you know, is a widely respected figure as the head of the Korean provisional government in the Second World War. Kimgu stood against the UN um, sponsored separate elections in South Korea, fearing that the separate election and the separate establishment of a Korean government only in South Korea would lead to an internecine civil war, which did take place, of course, two years later. So Kim Gu made a trip to Pyongyang in April 1948 to try in the last minute effort to work things over with Kim Il-sung with the North Koreans, which of course was not successful. And for that, Kim Gu has been misperceived by many Americans and South Koreans as somehow anti-US, which he was not. My point here is Ambassador Stevens' visit 
the first ever visit by a sitting South Korean ambassador to the Kim Kun Museum and Library made a great splash. It was reported widely by all the major daily newspapers. Why? Because it was the first visit by a U.S. ambassador in honor of this historical figure, and it engendered tremendous goodwill toward the United States, even among folks who were somewhat ambivalent about the U.S. and U.S. policy. So I bring this up to try to underscore the point. Any such gesture of respect, a visit by a U.S. political figure, I think, would be very helpful in further raising awareness on our issue of the day, the Jeju massacre. With that, Dr. Merrill. Thank you very much. Is this, am I coming over loud and clear? It yeah. says don't adjust microphones, okay. So I assume I am. I'm very pleased to be with you here today. Uh, this is an important conference, at least for me. I've been to several of the meetings in the series of conferences starting, oh, I don't know, I was in New York, I was in several others, uh, maybe starting in, at, in Chejido, at the present at the uh, origins, to borrow a phrase. Um, hopefully this conference will increase awareness of the uh, terrible tragedy that unfolded on Chejido some 75 years ago, um, and which until now has been largely and conveniently forgotten by people in the United States. I would say especially conveniently forgotten by the U.S. military, which is where I think some of your efforts should go to get them to set the history of these years right, since I agree with speakers in the present previous panel that the U.S. had command authority over South Korean forces during these years. There wasn't, I don't think there was even an embassy until 1948. Um, um, but um, they, they should get some what should I say, of your ire uh, or, or, or your ill feelings about the lack of responsiveness because it was them in the first instance that didn't say anything about these events for so long. Um, now having said that, I have to say a good word for the U.S. military because that's where I did most of my research. It was with an unofficial researcher's clearance from the Department of the Army. So I was here in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, I just prowled around the Center for Military History and other places to do my research. And it actually wasn't until a few years later when I had the pleasure to go to Chejido with Kathy Stevens that I actually visited the island in the flesh, so to speak. So my research was mostly book research early on. And then I had a Fulbright, and I had a, finally another chance to go to the island and spend some time there. Um, anyway, this is a tragedy that has been, I think, largely forgotten in the U.S., and I'll stick to my point. Kathy, I don't think, agrees with me, but I bet if you went somewhere in the State Department in random, maybe even in front of the Korea desk, and asked, can you tell me about the Jeju-do uprising? You probably wouldn't get too many takers because it's been suppressed largely, not talked about. And none of the underlying tension in the region that resulted ultimately in that tragedy on Chejido has been resolved. And as I said in the Q&A session in the previous panel, uh, 
we could see a tragedy unfold again on Jejido because there has been, in recent years, a big naval base built <coughs> there. Years ago, I taught a uh, course at uh, Georgetown, and one of my students was engaged to be married to a Korean medical doctor who was in the Navy, and that's where he was stationed. He was an oriental medical doctor, but he was stationed on Jeju Island. <coughs> and it pains me to think about the possibility that such a beautiful lady and her husband could go up and smoke in a nuclear attack. Hope that never happens. I first became aware of the tragedy that unfolded on Chejido after reading a short pamphlet, a part of a short pamphlet by a wonderful guy called David Steinberg, who used to teach at Georgetown um, and was with the Asia Society. What had happened about, about Chejido is it's just a brief mention. He said, this is something that has been covered up that no one writes about. And that was a point made by several of the panelists this morning. Um, it's buried history. No one wants to write about it because it's too embarrassing to write about. Um, but the potential for violence there now with nuclear weapons is even greater. And so we should, I think, pay more attention to the Korea problem, not just the 4 3 uprising, but the Korea problem more generally, because it could come back to haunt us. Uh, when I started out, there was, and this is something that Steinberg said, there was almost nothing written about Chejido in English. Uh, it was even more so the case in Korean. As we heard from several speakers this morning, until recently, discussion of Chejido was banned uh, under the National Security Act. You couldn't write about it. It was a verboten subject. And uh, I had to watch myself when I got in, landed in Korea on a Fulbright to make sure that the government knew what I was doing. Uh, and I was warned on my first day. I, uh, the Fulbright staff told me stories about a previous Fulbrighter the previous year who had been out drinking with friends in a bar and was loosely talking about the love life of Pak Chung-hee and someone was listening in on the conversation, unbeknownst to him. And he was asked within a week to get the hell out of the country. And fortunately, they were able to find a place for him in the Fulbright program in Japan. And so he made out okay. But uh, I was uh, forewarned. Uh, change it, I want to make a point that's, I think, an important point and that hasn't been made enough this morning or today. Chejido was not unique. That may sound a like a strange thing to say, but uh, I've written all my professional life about Chejido and other events in Korea, but we have to look at it in a broader compass. Chejido was one of a series of tragedies that unfolded throughout East Asia as former colonial powers sought to reimpose colonial structures in the aftermath of World War II. So you just look at a broad swath of East Asia and you can see this. Uh, you've got Korea, you've got uh, Taiwan, where the Kuomintang tried to massacre, largely succeeded, most of the indigenous leadership of the island around the same time that the Chejido uprising occurred. And it happened in Southeast Asia too. <clears throat> now I haven't studied these uprisings and I haven't tried to look at it in historical perspective, but I think that's a 
very important subject for research going forward. Chejido was not unique. It was part of a pattern. And I think we can learn something about the Chejido uprising by viewing it in that context as part of a broader pattern. And the pattern was that you had local populations that had been this is, I'm going to use some political science jargon here because I'm political science. I, are you a political scientist or a historian? Crypto historian. Crypto historian. <laughs> well, local populations had been mobilized, to use Sam Huntington's word, that is politically activated by the defeat of Japan. And that's why they resisted so strongly the attempt to reimpose colonial structures after the war. But not just in Chejido, everywhere. Um, at first, this may seem strange to say, the U.S. military government got on pretty well with the local government on the island, which was, uh, of course, the People's Committee. Um, because initially they tried to manage things with a very light hand. Uh, but uh, later, as they pressed down more strongly, some of these problems arose. And I think there's some good research that possibly could be done about the different approaches of the military government on the island and the occupation on the island. I, I'm, I don't know enough about this to to say too much more, but I, th I think there were differences, important ones. There was an era of good feeling that pervaded initially, but it dissipated very quickly as the Cold War reality sank in and the U.S. authorities became more concerned with control than they had been previously. The era of good feelings ended, and control became the paramount goal. One of the things that caused this, I think, was the so-called October People's Uprising in October of 1946, I believe it was, um, as Korea began to be caught up in the maelstrom of the Cold War, the wider Cold War. The strategy that the military government then adopted and U.S. advisors adopted, and this was referred to this morning or earlier this afternoon, was one of area clearance. The Chinese had a nice phrase for it, the three alls campaign, They're referring to the Japanese, but uh, all, of, all of the South Korean military officers at this time which is another problem, were veterans of the Japanese army, and veterans officers in the Japanese army. And their approach was, as I say, area clearance and to establish refugee camps along the coast of the island and try to relocate the entire population there. And the in interior of the island which, by the way, if you've never had a chance to visit, is, is astoundingly beautiful, uh, was to uh, burn all, kill all, destroy all. Anyone who the military encountered this. We're, we're talking by when I say the military, and this is a very complicated story, which maybe in a Q&A session we can get into. <clears throat> It was initially a constabulary force, not a, a, a military until after the Republic of Korea was founded. Um, but the idea was to cordon off the interior of the island and do sweeps. And anyone who was caught in the sweeps was presumed to be an enemy and was killed. It was a free fire zone. That's the reality. 
and you could, I don't know how it is now, but until a few, a few years ago, you could see ruins, plenty of ruins of destroyed villages on the slopes of Mount Hala. If you've ever been to Jeju-do, you know that the two important mountains in Korea, one is Hala and one is Bektu. Uh, and uh, we almost had a summit a few years ago, but it never happened because the, symbol, the symbolism was too, too good. Any, anyway, uh, I should say that uh, Kim Jong-un's mother was from the Ko family clan, I believe. And so he, initially he was a Jejidor. And uh, the symbolism of this would, would have been beautiful. The two highest peaks in Korea. But it never happened. I was working, I think, at the State Department at that time, and I was hoping it would happen. Never did. Uh, U.S. military advisors were present throughout all operations, most of, mostly all military operations on the island, and they did approve of this general strategy of area clearance. They may not have approved of the particular way in which it was implemented by a gung-ho South Korean military, but, but they, they were in charge and they should have known. They should have exercised oversight on that. There were also two U.S. naval destroyers cruising the coast off of Jeju-do at various periods during the rebellion to make sure that the <clears throat> rebels did not receive any supplies or reinforcements from the mainland. And the gravamen, the, the main charge against Pak Hanyun, the leader of the Namlodang faction in the Korean Labor Party, was originally that he encouraged a uh, adventurous charge into the teeth of American military bayonets on Jeju-do and led the Namlodang into a suicidal charge, which I suppose, I don't know about whether he could be held responsible, but that's maybe what happened. I tend to think that there's more spontaneity than planning in the uprising. In the sense, as I said, as I told you a minute ago, this, this this was if you look at this in broad perspective, this was one of many popular resistance movements in the aftermath of World War II. So I don't know how planned it was. There must have been some mastermind in Moscow, I guess, who was planning the KMT's massacre. On t I'm I'm being cynical here. On, uh, on Taiwan. But anyway, uh, I, I think the North Korean charge after the war, when Pak Hanyun was purged, is largely correct. He did, for one reason or another, he did lead a charge, an adventurous charge, into the teeth of American bayonets. Uh, now, I think it's important to say we only touched on it very briefly in discussion in previous sections, uh, that the very same potential for violence exists today on Jeju-do as it did then. And you have a huge South Korean naval base, which makes a big target for North Korean nuclear weapons if the balloon ever goes up if it ever comes to that. So this is not just a historical conference, and it should be something that energizes the United States government to take the problem of Korean unification a little bit more seriously than it has before. Oh, I know. You can look it up. On, you can Google it. There's some wonderful press release that says we have a policy that has this, that, and other components. But in fact, not a goddamn thing has been done about the Korean problem in this administration. 
And little was done in the previous administration, except high-profile Trump exercises and personal diplomacy with his buddy Kim Jong-un. But I hope we can get something going again. It stands to reason that Kim's mother was from the Ko clan, one of the big family groupings on, Korea, on Jeju-do. And it stands to reason that probably he learned something about what had happened there from his mum in his early years. And let's hope, I got one minute left and I'm finished <laughs> growing up. So that's all I have to say. Anything else will have to be in the Q&A session. Thank you. Kim Jong-un's mother was actually born in Osaka, Japan. Yes, so the but grandfather the family, is from family Jeju-do. Was, yeah, his, right. his, 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 uh, I think he was a, he worked in a te textile factory making Japanese uniforms. For the military. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. You know your history pretty well. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Sue Terry and to Dr. Lee, uh, as well as... Oh, I forgot Lee. that, so this goes for me, too. <laughs> yes, uh, on, the, on the behalf of the panel. Uh, thanks to Sue and to Dr. Lee and the, uh, the Peace Foundation in, in Walden, Korea, uh, for inviting us to take part in this conversation. And I should also say it's uh, fairly intimidating for me to follow in the footsteps of uh, so many distinguished experts uh, on the history of Korea, as well as, uh, sorry, on, on the uh, Cheju Rebellion, uh, as well as those with a family connection to this history uh, and other personal connections. So when preparing um, for my remarks today, I did something maybe a little unusual. I went back and read a paper I wrote many years ago as an undergraduate student that partially dealt with the Cheju uprising. Um, at that time, I had the good fortune of taking a class with a professor named Adam Cathcart, uh, who asked me to write a research paper about the origins of the Korean War. And Cheju didn't have to be a part of the paper, but as I did the research uh, and learned more about it, I found you know, this, this history so um, compelling and distressing that uh, Cheju did become a part of this, this research paper. Um, and, and there's a reason I mention this, and I think based on some of the discussion we've heard earlier today about how do we, um, how do we get people to remember or to even know that this uh, episode uh, ever took place, um, we talked about teaching and students, and I, and I suppose I'm a good example of what that can accomplish because I've internalized the history. Um, I remember the Cheju-do uprising. I should also say that my paper uh, that I wrote 15 years ago or more was littered with references to the work of John Merrill, um, which shows just how influential his writing uh, on this history is. Choose another word <laughs> than littered. <laughs> um, but for the, the purposes of, of today, <laughs> I wanted to, to um, not really make a coherent presentation or, or discussion of the Cheju-do uprising but really to, to highlight some of the themes, layers, um, legacies of the history that, that appealed to me. And, um, and before I dive in, I, I do want to just acknowledge that, you know, when we talk about Cheju, um, you know, we have to appreciate people, that this was something that really uh, deeply affected thousands and thousands of people and continues to affect uh, many people today even though we're, we're so far removed from this, this episode. Um, you know, Jeju, Jeju involved people who made choices um, about whether to rebel, about whether to employ violent tactics to suppress a rebellion, uh, about pe people who maybe wished to just be bystanders uh, but ended up becoming victims. But we also need to understand the structures and the conditions that condition, uh, that condition these human choices, that shape those human choices. And I'll try to be quick. Um, I think one of those conditions that we have to be mindful about was the, the history and legacies of the Japanese colonization of Korea, uh, which had a tremendous impact on Cheju Island in terms of people coming and going, uh, about the economy of the island, about the militarization of the island, 
uh, the presence of Japanese weapons, military installations, and so forth. Um, so this shaped, and especially the, the collapse of the Japanese empire, this really did shape uh, the social environment on the island that was one factor in, in what eventually took place. We also have to be mindful of the fact that in many ways the United States, and as uh, Dr. Merrill hinted, the South Korean army did come to embody a colonial presence on the island. Uh, in many ways it could seem as if uh, for the people of Cheju Island that they had had one colonial master, Japan, that had suddenly been replaced by another, uh, the United States with its South Korean allies. The great powers also con condition the choices available to the peoples of Cheju, uh, and specifically I'm referring to the failure of great power diplomacy when it came to reaching any sort of consensus or conclusion about the future of Korea. Um, many authors say the April 3rd, 1948 uprising was most directly a consequence of the decision to hold separate elections in South Korea, which effectively cemented the division between North and South. So how did we get to separate elections, which then may have helped to precipitate the uprising? Um, as we all know, after World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union each granted themselves control over one half of Korean territory, which was meant to be a temporary measure uh, until the Allied powers worked out the particulars of Korea's independence. Uh, in December 1945, the two countries um, moved forward on this promise by reaching the so-called Moscow Agreement, which formed a joint commission uh, which had the responsibility to, again, deliver on this promise of Korean independence. Uh, of course, the U.S.-Soviet Joint Commission deadlocked not once, but twice uh, over the next two years. And as it deadlocked, uh, negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union um, began to proceed on two parallel levels. One was this Joint Commission. The other was direct exchanges between the Soviet Foreign Minister and the U.S. Secretary of State. And if you read the correspondences between uh, these officials, it's, a, uh, it's really a case study in passive aggressive diplomacy. Uh, there, there was clearly no will on either side uh, to compromise or to, uh, to really live up to their promise. And the breaking point, as we've heard, came in September 1947 when the United States announced that it would jettison the Joint Commission uh, and instead of bilateral talks with the Soviet Union, it would turn the issue over to the United Nations. Uh, so the United States, uh, as we've, I think Dr. Lee was hinting earlier about this, um, has quite a bit of blame to share for this. The Soviet Union, for its part, really refused uh, this initiative on the part of the United States. It put forward its own a uh, competing resolution at the UN, which failed, the United States-led initiative passed, and then we know what the rest is history, uh, that the Soviets and its allies, uh, both within Korea and elsewhere, refused to participate in these UN-held elections, and we get the uh, emergence of a separate South Korean government, uh, thanks to the elections held in May 1948. And to be sure, you know, Koreans of all political stripes uh, shaped what the United States and the Soviet Union could and could not do. I mean, a lot of the diplomacy that was going on between the two countries was determined by what Koreans were doing uh, and saying. Um, but I think we can safely say that Cheju was a consequence of Soviet and American misdeeds and that it was a byproduct of the Soviet-American Cold War. Uh, Cheju was a, a tragedy in itself. Um, but it was also a predictor of things to come. Uh, and here I'm referring, obviously, to the Korean War. To follow up on something that John said, there is no evidence uh, that I've ever seen that North Korea had really anything to do with the Cheju uprising, uh, although the, you know, the South Korean Labor Party would have been favorable uh, to North Korea's political positions. Um, but... Jeju, Jeju was an intriguing moment for Kim Il-sung and the North Korean leadership, and Kim Il-sung certainly followed news of Jeju closely. Uh, at an inter-Korean meeting in July 1948, for example, uh, which was held 
as sort of a protest of the UN elections. Uh, the North Koreans highlighted uh, what happened in Cheju uh, as a, um, an example of popular protest against the South Korean regime. Um, after one of the leaders of the Cheju uprising, Kim Dalsam, escaped to North Korea, the DPRK showered him with praise for, quote, heroically resisting the South Korean armed forces. Uh, and in a September 1949 cable to Joseph Stalin, one of Kim Il-sung's uh, uh, interlocutors highlighted that while South Koreans were successful, uh, the South Korean government was successful in quelling uh, the uprising on Cheju, unrest was spreading across South Korea and partisans were becoming increasingly active uh, in the southern half of the peninsula. And this is important because partisans and the idea that there would be a popular uprising in South Korea was one of the primary ways that Kim Il-sung sold the Korean War to Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong. He claimed that as soon as North Korean troops crossed the 38th parallel, a popular uprising would follow, uh, and the, uh, which would lead to unification on North Korea's terms. And Could I interject something? Yeah. Uh, Years ago, I looked at the original transcript, not the published version <coughs> of Khrushchev's memoirs. And uh, Khrushchev described the situation, apropos of what you just said, as being an overheated balloon full of revolutionary fervor, which was ready to explode if it was just pricked with a pin it would blow up. So I think that's what Stalin may have thought he was getting into yeah. in the Korean War. And of course, that's not what happened. Um, uh, so just as well, you know, uh, I guess my point was Kim Il-sung drew a lesson from Cheju, which uh, encouraged him to want to launch an invasion. He could have just as well drawn a negative lesson, which was the United States and South Korea would do whatever it took to suppress uh, these types of uprisings. Um, lastly, I think uh, a, a theme I wanted to highlight is a relationship between Cheju and how we, um, this is a, histor a historian's term, uh, periodize the Korean War, which means, you know, basically when did the Korean War begin? And uh, there's a, a very well-known military historian who's written a lot about the Korean War, Alan Millett, and he says uh, quite simply that the Korean War began on April 3rd, 1948. And I think if you read the works of John Merrill, Peninsular Origins of the War, or Bruce Cummings, uh, you may come away with a, a similar um, conclusion. Um, well, what are the implications of saying the war began on April 3rd, 1948? You know, we, in, in the United States at least, we often say that it began on June 25th, 1950. What happened then? North Korea, with the backing of the Soviet Union and China, invaded South Korea, and that's the conventional interpretation. Very neat and clean. When did the war start? Who was responsible? Um, but if we backdate the start of the Korean War to 1948, uh, we're reminded that the Korean War was its at its heart a civil war. Um, that although the division between North and South Korea was artificial and imposed upon it from outside actors, uh, that Korean society was deeply fractured within the two respective Korean states. At the very least, Cheju was a sneak preview of what was to come. It was an extraordinarily violent, destructive conflict waged by Koreans of diametrically opposed politics, one that caused extreme social dislocation, uh, hardship, trauma, and invited outside intervention and participation from Americans, Russians, and Chinese. Now, I have no expectation that anyone in the broader public will start to say that the Korean War began on April 3rd, 1948. But I do think this can be a useful uh, strategy, particularly in the context of, of a classroom setting, to get people to think critically about the causes of the Korean War. Um, yes, the character and the scope of the conflict changed dramatically on June 25th, 1950, but there was an important chapter or chapters before this, uh, and Cheju can remind us that, um, again, the Korean War was its, at its heart a civil war. 
Um, I will stop there in the interest of time uh, and save any other com comments for the, the Q&A. But thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Krauss. Now, Dr. Ho. Hello. This is my great honor to make a, present, make a presentation about Jeju Mike. Sasamin. Mike. About Jeju Sasamin Peace Center in Washington. Mm, as a journalist and a researcher for studying Jeju forestry incident, my main interest is the relations between America and Jeju incident. So I'll focus on that matter. Uh, I read my prepared paper. I think few Americans have understood the title of the today's presentation, Jeju Incident in America. Even many Americans may be asked what is the relations between America and Jeju for the incident. Over 70 years ago, 25,000 to 30,000 islanders, or 10% of the Jeju population, were killed during the Jeju incident or uprising. Most of the victims were killed by government forces. So, oh, yes. The, this image is the Jeju Forestry Incident Investigation Report published by the Korean government in 2003. The report stated that commanding officers of the Korean regiment during the scorched earth policy are responsible for the killings and the final responsibility for the President Seung Man Lee. This report also remarked that the U.S. military government and the U.S. advisory group cannot be free from responsibility during the occurrence and suppression of Jeju Sasam. Today, I would like to talk about the role of U.S. military government during the Jeju incident through documents produced by the U.S. military and officials. Liberated from the Japanese colonial rule, as you know, South Korea was under military government by the U.S. Army from September 1945 to August 1948 when the South Korean government was established. An armed uprising by Jeju branch of South Korean Labor Party broke out on April 3, 1948. In the early stage of the uprising, U.S. military governor in South Korea at the time, Major General William F. Dean, gave instructions for the Korean Coast Guard and the Constabulary to carry out a joint operation. Please, please look at this image. General Dean cabled Lieutenant Colonel Mansfield of Jeju Military Government Company to use the Korean constabulary at your, at your disposal to eliminate the subversive elements on Jeju law. Late April, Commanding General of U.S. Forces in Korea, Lieutenant General Haji, He's the Supreme Commander in Southern Korea at the time. Informed four instructions to Mansfield in Jeju for handling of the Jeju situation, like this. One of the four instructions was the constabulary was, so, uh, was to immediately play a role. And another was, then, was that the US military would not be involved. And uh, after that, General Dean and Orlando Ward, uh, the commanding general of the 6th Division in Gwangju, visited Jeju together to assess the situation. They flew over the mountainous area when the constabulary was surrounding villages and uh, arresting all males aged over 18. Six days later, this time, General Dean, accompanied by Korean officials, visited Jeju Island again and held an emergency meeting. This day was the five days before the May 10 general election. But Jeju Island became the only area where the elections failed. The military government has increased the intensity of the crackdown. 
the punitive operations carried out under military government leadership reached their peak with the dispatch of Colonel Roswell Brown of the 6th Division. He was the supreme commander directing the operations not only of U.S. advisors, but also the Korea Constabulary forces and the police stationed on the island. General Haji gave orders for the military government company on Jeju and the Jeju U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps support Colonel Brown through all available means. Brown's dispatch stood in contrast with the attitude shown early on in the uprising with the orders at the time for the U.S. military to not allow itself to be seen. While U.S. advisors in Greece did not present in the operation area during the Greek civil war, U.S. but U.S. Army colonel commanded on Jeju Island. Yes, this is the Korean newspapers at that time. They reported that U.S. military reconnaissance aircraft took the skies over Jeju, while U.S. jeeps commanded combat on the front lines, and U.S. warships constantly belched black smoke as they guarded the nearby waters. Colonel Brown told the reporters, Korean reporters in Jeju Island, I am not interested in the causes of the incident. My mission is to clamp down. My mission is only to suppress. Under Brown's command, the Korea Constabulary began an indiscriminate arrest campaign. Residents who had fled to the upland areas were regarded as communists and rioters. Around 5,000 residents were arrested in over a month. Even after the government was established on August 15, 1948, the United States continued to exercise considerable influence on the South Korean military under the Korea-U.S. agreement. Based on that agreement, the Provisional Military Advisory Group, so-called PMEC, was organized with Brigade General William Roberts as its chief and assumed operational control for the South Korean armed forces. By October 1948, the guerrilla groups became more aggressive in their attacks on the police. They did not attack, the guerrilla groups did not attack the military or U.S. troops. They only attacked the police. As a response, Korea Constabulary launched the Scotched Earth Policy. The 9th Regimental Command on Jeju Island issued a decree that any will not trespass anywhere further than five kilometers from the coast, and violators, violators will be shot. Due to lack of transportation and communication, however, the decree was not properly relayed to the upland villages, and res residents who were classified as rioters and communists were obliged to flee into the hills or caves for their very survival. With large-scale punitive operations taking place, residents were given summary trials, were captured by Korean constabulary, police, and the extreme rightist groups. Much of the Jeju Do were engulfed in flames. The casualties of Jeju people were concentrated from November 1948 to March 1949. There were times when more than 100 people were slaughtered in one day. Yes, this, this shows that John Mucho, the special representative of American mission in Korea called AMIC, uh, later became the first U.S. ambassador in Korea, voiced concerns about the South Korean military's inabilities to root out Jeju Island communists in a cable to the State Department on November. At that time, it's the, as I said, it's a scratched us, there are scratched us in Jeju Island. Finally, the regimental commander declared martial law by the approval of the president. Martial law declaration not only restricted civil rights, 
but also served to justify civilian massacres. As you see, U.S. advisors also made active use of the extreme rightist Northwest Youth League to be constabulary and police in Jeju Island. You see that commanded by several Amer American officers. Meanwhile, the tragic situation that was taking place on Jeju would not be reported outside the island as the government and armed forces controlled the press. But the U.S. advisor in Jeju attended the regular staff meeting of the Korean constabulary and knew the killings. He reported the uh, uh, regiment's daily activities to Seoul's headquarters. Yes, on 18 December 1948, when Jeju Island was destroyed to the ashes, General Roberts recommended to Korean Prime Minister in his letter that 9th Regiment Commander's activities be largely publicized by media, radio, and presidential statement. In reply, Korea Defense Ministry Chief of Staff sent General Roberts a letter stating that Regimental Commander and the U.S. Army Advisor had shown fine capabilities on Jeju Island that he would recommend the announcement of a presidential statement. General Roberts' perceptions of Jeju situation both rationalized and encouraged the killings. Under the civilian massacres were occurred continuously, the high-ranking official, Everett uh, Counselor, as I know, Counselor, Everett Drumwright of American Mission in Korea, sent a letter to General Roberts on March 10, 1949, concerning the situation on Jeju. In his letter, he wrote, the situation on Jeju Island is pretty serious that, and that some rather positive action will have to be taken to ameliorate the situation there. In a reply the following day, Roberts informed the drum right that he had recently sent a strong letter to the prime minister and then had a copy sent to the president on the island, guerrilla and military situation there. Among these, Among these, Mucho cabled the State Department that Jeju Island was chosen as the spot for a major Soviet effort to sow confusion and terror in South Korea, and it seems obvious that Soviet agents are being filtered into Jeju without difficulty. But, but there is no evidence that the Soviet's involvement in Jeju situation. It can be said that these reports had driven Jeju Island to the scene of the confrontation of the Cold War. Even after the successful redo election on May 10, 1949, massacres were still being committed in the name of eradicating communis communists. On October, two, on October 1949, 249 people were executed according to court martial decisions with the approval of the president. But the newspaper didn't even report a single line of this terrible mass execution. But U.S. advisors knew the situation accurately and reported that to the headquarters. In the same months, in the same months, Ambassador Mucho reported to the State Department that he was glad to be able to report that Jeju op operation was so devastatingly successful. During the Jeju Forcery incident, documents sent to the State Department by Army uh, American mission in Korea include the phrases including as the state is interested or as the state is aware. That shows that information on Jeju incident was being continuously reported to the department. Even after the Korean War broke out, the United States showed a continuing interest in guerrilla activity on Jeju Island and proposed measures to quell it, many of which were taken up by the South Korean government and armed forces. Now, I'll finish my presentation. I can't say everything about Jeju forcibly uprising in 15 minutes. We need, to, we need to join to research and find the documents more. After the democratization movement in South Korea in the late 1980s, the Jeju forcibly fact-finding movement was launched. And for the past 30 years, research on the role of America in the Jeju uprising 
have been conducted in Korea. After World War II, many research has been done on the U.S. intervention during the Greek Civil War. However, the academic and political circles in, the Ameri in America do not seem to be interested in Jeju uprising so far. A case in which the U.S. directly or indirectly intervened in an incident in a small region such as Jeju Island is extremely unusual since World War II. Jeju Island has changed from the ashes to the most prosperous tourist place in South Korea. Jeju Island, which attracts more than 13 million tourists a year, has become the hot, hottest place where the South Koreans want to go sightseeing the most. Next year marks the 75th anniversary of Jeju Fosri incident. Many people, many people would attend the memorial service. I hope the American officials attend the the service. We must strive for the universal values of peace and human rights. The famous Holocaust Memorial Hall in Washington was built for that purpose, and visitors try not to forget the past. I believe the Korea-U.S. relations are st strengthened through a deep understanding of the tragic events of the past. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I think the what seem like endless rows and columns of crosses on unmarked graves in honor of the nameless victims at the Jeju Peace Park and Museum is, you know, this, the solemnity of the landscape reflects, I think, the prolonged silence the coerced silence and the prolonged agony of the families, of the victims. And I mention this just to make the point that on your next visit to Jeju, for fun, I hope, please you know, consider visiting the museum and the park. It's very grand. It's very um, moving. So, well, we'll open up the floor to any questions. I'm sure we are not all experts, so um, if you have any doubts or some, uh, something that's unclear to you, please. Gentleman in the back and then gentleman with the tie in the um, behind. <clears throat> if, you uh, would, if you would kindly state your name and affiliation, if sure. any. Uh, John Burton. I'm a Washington columnist for the Korea Times. Um, it w was the uprising in any way, could it also be considered an issue of regional autonomy? because it was my impression that uh, Cheju, uh, the people on Cheju-do, had always historically had a sense of independence. I believe it was also a place of political exile under the Yi uh, dynasty. Um, so did, is this not just a ideological conflict, but rather a regional one as well? And I, my second question is, how much American uh, U.S. media re reporting was going on, contemporary media reporting was going, uh, going on uh, during this period? Because it would seem to me that would explain the lack of knowledge about this in the U.S. Would anyone like to take up on this? I, I can yeah. respond to the second yeah. part. And just very quickly, and say it was it was reported on in the U.S. media uh, quite a bit, I think, in the New York Times. Um, so it's not that it was uh, unknown, but it, um, it, it was in the media. Yeah, 지금 columnist John, Mr. John의 그두 가지 질문에 대해서 답변 드리겠습니다. You said it's an internal independence uh, autonomy in the region. That was your question. Some researchers say that some of them argue that it can be seen
and as uh, the regional autonomy, like you pointed it out, because as we discussed before, we have this extreme right wing uh, youth group called Sochung, the Northwest Youth Group. They did the horrible things in in Jeju. They did they did all these high handed uh, activities and brutal activities against uh, the Jeju people. It was a protest against uh, that brutality. And one person in the strike said that they uh, claim that they had no choice being killed doing by nothing or doing something and they will they'll be killed anyway because they have the police and they have this right wing extremist uh, youth group because as a young um, native uh, person in Jeju, they said that they cannot turn a blind eye to the, all the atrocities done against their own people. So yes, it can be uh, interpreted as uh, some kind of a struggle for the regional autonomy. And as Mr. Uh, Kraus mentioned, yeah, Los Angeles Times and news, uh, the Christian Science Monitor and New York Times, there were reports the source was only one single source. They, they never ran to the coverage in, in the on the field. They they referred to this as one source. The report by the U.S. military government. So, the report, ninety nine point nine percent, all the coverage in the U.S. was biased. So. They only uh, they reported what the U.S. military achieved, not the killings on the Jeju people. I'd like to um, translate um, with few embellishments, perhaps an addition of my own views as well. In the context of your question, did Jeju's history of autonomy um, have an impact? Many scholars think yes. The traditional relative autonomy enjoyed by the islanders was a factor in shaping the following view. The interventions by the extreme right-wing group called Northwest Youth League, which were violent thugs, basically, and the pillaging and the crimes committed against the people of Jeju for um, over months did impel Jeju islanders to feel this is a matter of survival. Either we just sit here and do nothing and die, or we die standing up and fighting, resisting. So there is that historical narrative of a struggle to protect the autonomy and the lives and the livelihoods of the people of Jeju. With respect to your second question, yes, there were media reports, foreign reports of what happened, but they all relied on the U.S. Army military government in Korea reports. So there was no independent investigative reporting, but the same narrative told, repeated by these foreign journalists. I would also add that there were rebellions at the end of the E dynasty on Chejudo very serious ones. And so again, the remoteness of the island, there was this tension between central control and local autonomy, which was a factor as well. But as you said, John, for a while, the military government, the US government, and the Jeju Island People's Committee got along very well. Yeah. And but then as the military took all, not all, but more than half of the, uh, the harvest, rice, away from the island, severe food shortage, the outbreak of cholera, and all kinds of you know, infectious diseases and privations um, led to the souring of the relationship. Young man in the back with a tie, handsome tie. Thank you. For today's talk, uh, my name is Do Young. I'm a second year master's student from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I'm currently studying under Dr. Lee in Korea class today. Uh, my first question goes to Dr. Mel Yu today. You briefly mentioned that Jeju April 3rd incident 
is part of the grand pattern that persisted in Asia in 1900s. Um, then if so, why do you think Jeju incident gains less attention relatively to other major incidents that happened in Asia? Um, and my second question is, um, seeing what's happening in Ukraine, also in Burma and China too, seems like such human rights atrocities still persist in today and mankind never learns a lesson from the history. So what drives such events and what should be done to prevent such events? Thank you. Well, um, I'm not so sure that the mainstream narrative on what's happening in the Ukraine is correct. I don't know, but I think we may have been sold a bill of goods by the Zelensky government and the Biden administration on what's going on. I can't prove it. It's just a feeling. And I'm not defending anything that the Russians have done. But uh, it just seems fishy to me. Many things just don't add up. Uh, what was the other question? So that's that's what I have to say about... Pardon me? Why the U.S. taxpayer should send billions of, literally now, billions of dollars to support Zelensky. And we know from news reports that Ukraine is one of the most corrupt governments in the world. Where is all this money going? Who's doing an audit of it? It just doesn't make sense to me. Anyway, that's just a personal feeling. I haven't studied it. I can't prove any of this. Well, coming back to Cheju, what was the first yeah, part of your question? Yeah, what was the question? first question? Uh, so you briefly mentioned uh, during your remark that Cheju incident is part of this grand pattern that yes. persisted in Asia. What makes Cheju incident gaining less attention to other major events that happened in Asia? I haven't, I haven't studied that. It's a, that, that's a question for you. I mean, I, I maybe, maybe, it, it's cliche. Maybe it, it, it's cliche. Um, it, but everyone knows in the United States we call the Korean War the Forgotten War. Whether it's truly forgotten or not, that, that's debatable. Um, but if if we accept that at face value that the Korean War is the Forgotten War, well, this is a, a forgotten chapter in, in a forgotten war. Forgotten war yeah. um, Whereas, you know, I think, you know, other, ma you know, if you look at sort of Vietnam War massacres, which uh, if, you, if you look at what was going on in U.S. domestic society at that time uh, with the peace movement and where people were really, really invested in this conflict, uh, of, of course they're going to pay attention to the different massacres that took place in Vietnam. Um, but, I mean, it, it's why do we f remember one thing? Why do we forget another I mean, that's that's a, a really complicated question, and I don't know that anyone will ever be able to give an answer. Um, and, the, you know, the same goes for your, your second question. I mean, if anyone tells you they have a, a, an answer, they're, they're, they're selling, you, selling you something. Um, I, I would probably go back to what Ambassador uh, Stevens had said earlier, which was, you know, the U U.S. has ideals. We don't always live up to them, but uh, usually we eventually... Uh, will at least acknowledge that we didn't live up to them. Um, and some of the countries you, you mentioned, China, Burma, uh, Russia, I don't know that they, those governments uh, are inspired by the same sets of ideals, and it's not a surprise to me that they might repeat some of these tragic mistakes. You know, you could. Uh, I think the Northwest Youth Association is a very good point. They were a proxy. It wasn't the U.S. military. It wasn't the South Korean constabulary. We subcontracted the dirty work out to them, and they did it very well from a military standpoint on Chejido. So in a way, it's like the way that we dealt later with insurgent movements in the third world. Um, it's a dirty business and we didn't want to be directly involved. 
제가 한마디 제가 한마디 할게요. 네. 어, 제가 한마디 할게요. 아까 왜 관심을 덜 받는가? Uh, you, you as for your question why Jeju is gaining less attention? Why now? The Korean War, you said it's a forgotten war in the U.S. You mentioned it. Uh, the Jeju 4-3 is a uh, forgotten, it's not a forgotten incident. It was a tabooed incident during these uh, dictatorships and military. It was a forbidden history in Korea. And just, just mentioning that would uh, take a lot of courage. And many people had to go through so much suffering just uh, mentioning that. The Taiwan 2.8 is the same thing in the Northeast Asia. The democratic uh, movement and the fervor was happening and the, since 1980s, the democratic movement in the 1980s. Uh, that's, the, that's how we, the fact-finding into the Jeju 4.3 started. And uh, the, the, in the, the case in uh, Taiwan also went to the same path as um, uh, Dr. M John Merrill mentioned, uh, the Northwest said it's not mastermind. Well, I think Northwest is uh, independent and it was mastermind. And uh, as I showed you earlier in the uh, paper, it was recommended, encouraged by the U.S. military and the local authorities under the Lee Sung Man administration and the police and constabulary mobilized. He said it was mastermind. Okay. <laughs> 현재 말로 표현을 하자면은 so, 이거를 외주 용역을 Youth associations, like the Northwest Youth, Youth Association. That's a theme that you can see in some We are al already three stuff. minutes, four minutes behind schedule. I'll so okay, I'll, I'll shut up. I got one more sentence to say. <laughs> With some of the wet work that has been subcontracted out, pardon me, so over the years by the CIA, the same pattern. We don't do the dirty work ourselves. え、ちょうど半号丸を質問하겠습니다。あ、最初いろんなコンフォレンスがいけ、ちょうど4年ぶと毎年いっしゃってました。で、いろけ、ちょうど、ちょうど、ちょうど、ちょうど、ちょうど
in Korea at that time. But I do think, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not drawing a connection between the suppression of Cheju and these sorts of attitudes, but I do think it was quite widespread at that time uh, amongst high-level leaders to, to believe that Korea, Koreans, maybe weren't ready for independence. Um, I, I think you can find a lot of examples of that, even as the United States government, as official policy, was trying to move, uh, work with the Soviet Union to uh, achieve Korean independence. At the same time, informally, you have people like Douglas MacArthur or um, uh, General Hodge saying fairly derisive things about Koreans. and. Um, it's an unfortunate reflection of that era where uh, you have a Western power come in and, and think they know better uh, without really probably trying to understand the people and the culture. Well, yes and no. So you have a, you have a, a point in some cases. <coughs> it depends. A lot of Americans go to Korea and they love the place. I would love, I think I'm too old anymore to hobble off a plane on Cheju and go enjoy myself in one of the big hotels, but I'd love to do that. Um, so I wouldn't overgeneralize, basically, is what I'm saying. Finally. Time to end? No. I'm going to abuse my prerogatives as the moderator, possibly in violation of Wilson Center rules, and pick on somebody in the audience and ask that person a question. <laughs> Who's in the audience? Hyunseung. As the youngest party member of the Korean Workers' Party of Korea, North Korea, in your studies and career in North Korea, did you ever hear about the Jeju uprising? Because I would think Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il might be a bit sensitive about talking about people's uprising. Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks for asking, Dr. Lee. Fellow at Global Peace Foundation, extremely intelligent pundit, uh, sought-after sought um, advisor to the U.S. government. Yeah. Thank you for this amazing, you know, events. I learned a lot today. I mean, I absolutely have no idea what was going on in 19 you know, 50 before. Um, so I do learned, I did learn about the Jeju incident very briefly in my um, history class and political class when I was in uh, North Korea, but they didn't mention any, you know, involvement of North Korea. And like people just, I think I always thought that people just wanna like a liberal democracy and uh, uh, avoid oppression by the military government from, I mean, the US military government. That's what I taught. So um, they deny any involvement. Um, That's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> because they want to blame to US government and then President Sung Man Lee. So that's the logic, I guess, I you know learned. Um, well, I, yeah. I kind of agree with that <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> Well, but, thank but you. But there's some thank subtext you. I just want to mention. We have a reception waiting for us. Oh, <laughs> we have a reception. No, no, no come, come on, come on, please. No, there's some subtext here. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, this conflict within the North Korean leadership between Park Hong Young and Kim Il Sung and Park Hong Young's purge and the criticism that he led an adventurous charge into the teeth of American bayonets. I don't know that Chejido was mentioned, but I assumed when I read that, that that was what the reference was to. Can you give me your opinion? Please. It's very short, yep, thank you. Yeah, uh, the charges against Pak Han Yun. Uh -huh the head of the Namnodong faction in the South Korean, in the, yeah, in the Korean Workers' Party, was that he had led an adventurous charge into the teeth of American bayonets. Did you ever hear of Park Hong-young? 
in yes, history? Yes, um, but the very brief history, and then uh, we believe Park Geun Young is the uh, anti-government, anti-party, and traitor. So we do not discuss anymore about Park. Did they mention Jeju-do in connection with Park? I never heard of any connection with Park. Okay, thank you, Dr. Terry. Please. <laughs> question. I do think there was a patroni patronizing view, perhaps, oh, of the sure. Koreans per um, Chuck was trying to say that also ignorance by the, Amer the on behalf of the Americans, right? They couldn't really even distinguish the Koreans and, and the Japanese. And so patronizing view and ignorance. Anyway, we had a long day, so I'm not going to elaborate. So we one, do have one, a twine one, and one cheese. Last, one last point. John. Co Koreans were <laughs> She's P the boss in here. Koreans were POW guards in the yeah. Japanese prisoner of war camps. Yeah. There, you're right. There was that, that attitude, oh. but some of it stemmed from that fact. Thank you. You can hear more from John when you're out. Um, <laughs> at, um, but, um, 감사합니다. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you.